partnership, at least for now, okay? So, Garrett, walk us through the hypotheticals here. What happens in either scenario if this motion to vacate fails or succeeds? What happens next? Who would occupy the seat? Sure. So if McCarthy can make the math work somehow, and I don't know how he could to defeat this motion to vacate, that's it at least for the day. But the way the House rules are currently written, Matt Gates or anyone else could file another motion to vacate basically every day, and we could go through this entire exercise over and over again while the rules remain what they are. But if the motion succeeds, McCarthy is immediately out as Speaker, and a Speaker pro tem would put, be put in his place, a temporary Speaker, ironically selected by McCarthy. Then at some point Point. And it's not entirely clear when, but soon we begin that entire laborious process again of selecting a speaker, someone having to get to a majority, and boy, it's tough to see how that math works either with the chamber so narrowly divided and Republicans so divided amongst themselves. And Garrett, just to clarify, what we're seeing on the screen right now, we were showing numbers on the screen. That is not mm. the vote yet. No, right? this is the first vote in a series, a procedural vote related to another bill. It has nothing to do yeah. with this, except it will tell us one thing that could be important later. It'll tell us who's here today. Mm. That column on the right of not voting, if people are out sick today or if they're mm. absent, that could change the math. It, the numbers could be so close that somebody who's stuck in traffic right. or out with a sick Makes kid a difference. Could, affect the, could affect the totals today. All right, Garrett Haig, I know you will stay on top of it, and we'll come back to you if we hear anything dramatic. Thank you. Thanks so much. Former President Donald Trump is back in a New York courtroom. On this vote, the yeas are 218, the nays are 207. The previous question is ordered. The question is on adoption of the resolution. Those in favor will say aye. Those opposed, no. 
Opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. Gentlelady from Pennsylvania. Mr. Speaker, we would request a roll call vote on the rule. Roll call vote is requested. Those favoring a roll call vote will rise. Sufficient number having risen, a roll call vote is ordered. Members will record their votes by electronic device. This is a five minute vote.
process, but he refused to answer a question about whether he would continue to stand for speaker if he lost this first vote. And why that matters here is after the motion to vacate vote, he could just as easily turn around and run for the job again and put us into another kind of 15 vote grind like we saw back in January. To try to if he can win, win folks back over. McCarthy likes to talk all the time about how he's a fighter and how he doesn't give up. And I think a lot of folks, myself included, expected him to say, yes, of course, I'll keep fighting and ask twice variations of that question he didn't answer that way. So if he does lose on this motion to vacate, perhaps that's the last of Speaker McCarthy and he won't put his name forward. It's tough to read between the lines here with any surety, but I was surprised by his answer to that question, Kate. And Garrett, notably, this is only the third time a motion to vacate has really been presented in this way. I know you said we're still not sure who is in Congress today, right? Who has shown up to work, right. but what's the overall tenor uh, on the Hill right now? Look, I, I think the word unprecedented has been worn out over the last five or six years, but we are in largely unprecedented circumstances here. This has been tried three times, but nobody alive has experienced it. The last time was in, I think, 1910. And it's never been done successfully as it looks like it might happen here. I mean, this morning I was standing outside this Democratic conference meeting, caucus meeting, for two hours as they discussed this incredibly historic moment. That's the feeling that uh, is sort of overriding everything here today. All right, Garrett Haig on Capitol Hill for us with that late-breaking news. Speaking to Speaker Kevin McCarthy, thank you so much. The little girl who went missing at a campsite in upstate New York over the weekend is home again. New York's...
On this vote, the yeas are 218, the nays are 208, the resolution is adopted. Without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid on the table. For what purpose does the gentleman from Florida seek recognition? Mr. Speaker, I rise to a question of the privileges of the House and offer the resolution I previously noticed. The clerk will report the resolution. House Resolution 757, resolved that the office of the Speaker of the House of Representatives is hereby declared to be vacant. The resolution qualifies as a question of the privileges of the House. For what purpose does the gentleman from Oklahoma seek recognition? Motion uh, to table at the desk. The clerk will report the motion. Mr. Cole of Oklahoma moves to lay the resolution on the table. The question is on the motion to lay the resolution on the table. Those in favor will say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. No. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. Gentlelady from Pennsylvania. Yes, we would request the yeas and nays on this vote. The yeas and nays are requested. Those favoring a vote by the yeas and nays will rise. Sufficient number having risen, the yeas and nays are ordered. Members will record their votes by electronic device. This is a 15-minute vote.
On this vote, the yeas are 208, the nays are 218. The motion is not adopted. Pursuant to Clause 2A2 of Rule 9, the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Gates, and the gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Cole, will each control 30 minutes. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Florida. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I yield such time as you may consume to my colleague from Virginia, Mr. Good. Gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Good, is recognized for such time as he may consume. And before the gentleman speaks, may I remind my colleagues that all parties need to be heard. Would you please clear the well and clear the aisles? And any extraneous conversations need to be taken from the floor. Gentleman from Virginia is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Like so many others, I deeply regret that we are here in what was a totally avoidable situation. I must take you back to January, however, which for many of us was about not repeating the failures of the past and letting Republican voters across the country down once again, when in the past, for many years, when Republicans have had majorities in this chamber, we have passed our major spending bills predominantly with Democrat votes, something the other side of the House has never and would never do with majority control. Back in January, I expressed my concern that the previous two years during my first term here in this House, we had not used every tool at our disposal to fight against the harmful, radical Democrat agenda that is destroying the country bankrupting the country and under which the American people are suffering. But most in here wouldn't know that I helped persuade my five colleagues who comprised the remaining resistance in the wee morning hours of January 7 to switch our votes to present to let Mr. McCarthy become Speaker. And I went to him on this very floor to tell him that he was finally going to become Speaker on the next vote. In that moment, it was clear to me that I or we could have asked for anything in exchange for switching our votes to present, but I and we asked for nothing. The very next week, I requested and had a meeting with Speaker McCarthy to tell him he had my full support and that I wanted him to be successful because the country needed him to be successful. In the ensuing months, I helped him narrowly pass the Parents' Bill of Rights and the Limit Save Grow Bill, I think both of those by just one or two votes, helping persuade some of my most conservative colleagues to come along despite some of the concerns they had with those bills. And we remained united as a conference through the Limit Save Grow vote as we passed a bill that was cutting spending to pre-COVID levels for non-defense discretionary spending, or just over $100 billion, historic spending cuts, as the Speaker had committed to do in January, and it also included a host of other conservative fiscal reforms. Unfortunately, however, that unity and that commitment to significant year one cuts and spending reforms were discarded, were discarded in the Failed Responsibility Act, as I call it, which passed overwhelmingly once again with a majority of Democrat votes, validating the concern many of us had in January. Many of us had begged the Speaker, pleaded with the Speaker repeatedly to utilize the debt ceiling to leverage spending cuts and reforms. But instead, he negotiated an unlimited increase to the debt ceiling through January of 25. As much as we can come together and gleefully spend through January of 25 with no significant wins for the American people in that FRA or Failed Responsibility Act. But the Speaker then said that we would use appropriations. We would use appropriations to bring the fight and finally reduce our spending. He said the levels of the FRA were the ceiling and not the floor and committed, recommitted multiple times to go back to the $1.471 trillion that was the limit save grow levels, radically, historically, saving $100 billion 
and lowering the deficit this year under a Republican majority from $2.2 trillion to $2.1 trillion. That's what we were asking the Republican House to do, to go to $2.1 trillion. Meanwhile, the Speaker had committed to bring a balanced budget vote to this floor, something that still has not happened, despite the work that's been done in our budget committee to mark it up and have it ready to come to the floor. He also promised that we would bring all 12 appropriation bills well before the September 30 fiscal deadline. We did not. We simply, as Republicans, needed the Speaker to cast the vision, request the support, the support of the entire conference, all of whom voted for the Limit, Save, Grow levels, except for four who wanted to go even further, to, to lead us in joining him, sticking with him, supporting him, and sending the most conservative spending bills with the, the most conservative cuts possible to the Senate as the best starting position for negotiation with the Senate. Many of us begged and pleaded with the Speaker to do that over the past five, year, five months. When the Speaker failed us to pass our spending bills, bringing only one of 12 to the floor before the August district work period, members began to negotiate amongst themselves without the Speaker to find compromise. I was among those who reluctantly agreed last month to split the difference between failed responsibilities 1.586 and the limit save grow 1.471, I reluctantly agreed to do that, to go to 1.526 in order to pass our bills on to the Senate. We then essentially forced the Speaker, with the pressure of the calendar, the debt ceiling, or excuse me, the, the shutdown threat of the calendar, to bring those four bills to the floor last week, all of which I voted for, despite some of them not cutting the levels we'd agreed to and other concerns I had with the bills. I reluctantly voted for the 30-day conditional CR, or continuing resolution, because it cut an additional $10 billion in the month of October, going back to the pre-COVID 1.471 levels for defense, non-defense discretionary, 30 percent, and it had border security. I voted for that. However, when that vote failed, the Speaker this past Friday in the Republican conference meeting made it abundantly clear that he was willing to do anything to avoid the temporary discomfort and the pressure of a pause in the 15 percent of the non-essential federal government operations, which would guarantee that we would lose to the Senate Democrats and the White House. If you're not willing to say no, then you're guaranteed to lose. And that was confirmed with the passage of the unconditional 45-day CR this past Saturday, once again with 209 Democrat votes. The Republican bill, 209 to 1 Democrats, 51 to 0 on the Senate side. The Speaker fought through 15 votes in January to become Speaker, but was only willing to fight through one failed CR before surrendering to the Democrats on Saturday. We need a Speaker who will fight for something, anything, besides just staying or becoming Speaker. If there was ever a time to fight, with $33 trillion in national debt, a $2 trillion deficit this year, 40-year high inflation, 20-year high interest rates, a downgraded credit rating, and for the first time in modern history, the polls showing, despite all the help of the media blaming Republicans in the House, the polls showed that the public was blaming Biden and the Democrats for an imminent shutdown. If not fight now, when would we fight? Now is and was the time. With the Democrats driving the fiscal bus off the cliff at 100 miles an hour, we cannot simply be content to be the party that slows it down to 95 just so we can sit in the front seat and wear the captain's hat. Our current debt and our spending trajectory is unsustainable. We need a speaker, ideally somebody who doesn't want to be speaker and hasn't pursued that at all costs for his entire adult life, who will meet the moment and do everything possible to fight for the country. A red line was crossed for me, I regret, on Saturday, and chose regret that I must vote against the motion to table, as I did, and to vote to vacate the chair. And I yield back. Our sir. Gentleman from Florida reserves his time. Gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Cole. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I share one thing in common with my uh, friend from Virginia. This is a very sad day, and certainly a day I never expected to have to live through. You know, I think, broadly speaking, as I look across this floor, you can divide members into three groups. I'm very happy to be in the first group. The overwhelming majority of my party supports the speaker that we elected. 
We're proud of the leadership he's shown. We're proud of the manner in which he's been willing to work with everybody in our conference and, I believe, in this chamber. There's a second group, small group. Uh, honestly, uh, they're willing to, ca to plunge this body into chaos and this country into uncertainty for reasons that only they really understand. I certainly don't. And then there are friends on my, the other side. I mean friends, honestly, uh, with great sincerity. I have a lot of friends over there. And I recognize that my friends on the other side have a very complex set of partisan, personal, and uh, political calculations to make. And I certainly wouldn't presume to give them any advice about that. But I would say think long and hard before you plunge us into chaos, because that's where we're headed if we vacate the speakership. You know, I personally think there's really three reasons why we've come to this point. That's because at each three of these critical minutes, the speaker did the right thing. First, there was a speaker vote. You know, he got 85 percent of the vote in our conference, 90 percent of the vote from Republicans on this floor. Yet we had a small group that decided, no, they would dictate what they want. He didn't let that happen. He fought. Now, he fought for himself, but he fought for 90 percent of us, too, that wanted him to be the speaker. And I appreciate that. Then, of course, we had the debt ceiling deal. Nobody here thought he could pass a bill. Nobody in America thought he could pass a bill. He did what speakers are supposed to do. He passed the bill. Then he sat down and negotiated with a Democratic Senate and a Democratic president and came back with a good deal, a deal that will limit spending. He did the right thing. Finally, last Saturday on this floor, we were on the verge of a government shutdown, a government shutdown that the vast majority of members in this chamber did not want, a substantial majority on my side, an overwhelming majority on the Democrat side. He put his political neck on the line, knowing this day was coming, to do the right thing, the right thing for the country, without a doubt. My friends and I agree on that, whether or not we agree on the speaker. He did the right thing. He did the right thing, I think, for this institution. He showed it could function in a time of crisis. And finally, I think he did the right thing for our party. He made sure that we could continue to negotiate and achieve some of the very objectives my friend uh, from Virginia laid out and achieve them in divided government, which calls for some degree of give and take. So I'm very proud of this speaker. I'm very proud to stand behind him. Tomorrow morning, whether I win or lose, I'm going to be pretty proud of the people I fought with, and I'm going to be extraordinarily proud of the person I fought for, the Speaker of the House, Kevin McCarthy. And with, and with that, I reserve the balance of my time. Gentlemen from Oklahoma's time is reserved. Gentlemen from Florida. Mr. Speaker, my friend from Oklahoma says that my colleagues and I who don't support Kevin McCarthy would plunge the House and the country into chaos. Chaos is Speaker McCarthy. Chaos is somebody who we cannot trust with their word. The one thing that the White House, House Democrats, and many of us on the conservative side of the Republican caucus would argue is that the thing we have in common, Kevin McCarthy said something to all of us at one point or another that he didn't really mean and never intended to live up to. I don't think voting against Kevin McCarthy is chaos. I think $33 trillion in debt is chaos. I think that facing a $2.2 trillion annual deficit is chaos. I think that not passing single subject spending bills is chaos. I think the fact that we have been governed in this country since the mid 90s by continuing resolution and omnibus is chaos. And the way to liberate ourselves from that is a series of reforms to this body that I would hope would outlast Speaker McCarthy's time here, would outlast my time here, and would outlast either of our majorities. Reforms that I have heard some of the most conservative members of this body f uh, fight for, and some of the reforms that we've been battling for that I've even heard those in the Democrat caucus say would be worthy and helpful to the House, like open amendments, like understanding what the budget is. We have been out of compliance with budget laws 
for most of my life, most of many of your lives. And by the way, if we did those things, if we had single subject bills, if we had an understanding on the top line, if we had open amendments, if we had trust and honesty and understanding, there would be times when my conservative colleagues and I would lose, might be a few times when we'd win, there'd be times that we would form partnerships that might otherwise not be uh, really predictable in the American body politic, but the American people would see us legislating. These last few days, we've suspended the momentum that we had established the week earlier, where we were bringing bills to the floor, voting on them, staying late at night, working hard. That's what the American people expect. It's something Speaker McCarthy hasn't delivered, and that's why I've moved to vacate the chair. I reserve. Gentleman's time is reserved. Gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Cole. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I yield two minutes to my very good friend, Mr. Emmer from Minnesota. Gentleman from Minnesota, Mr. Emmer is recognized for two minutes. Thank you. Kevin McCarthy has earned this. Under Speaker McCarthy's leadership, our House Republican majority has actually defied all odds and overperformed expectations again and again and again. It all started with the Speaker's race. When our Speaker, Kevin McCarthy, showed the American people how he would never give up. It carried over into the Speaker spearheading a rules package to create the most transparent, member-driven legislative process that I've ever seen since I've been here. And since then, Speaker McCarthy's Republican majority has been successful in bringing common sense back to our nation's capital by passing legislation to affirm a parent's right to be involved in their child's education bolster American energy production, fully fund veterans care and benefits, fight back against the regulatory state and continue delivering on our promise to rein in Democrats' reckless spending by passing fiscally responsible appropriations bills. We've also achieved historic conservative wins like passing the strongest border security legislation in history, passing the first Republican-only NDAA in history, and passing the first Republican-only state and foreign operations appropriations bill. So many Americans are better off because of Kevin McCarthy's leadership. American families, job creators, entrepreneurs, service members, law enforcement officers, and the list goes on and on. These are just a few of our House Republican majority successes. But make no mistake, we need Kevin McCarthy to remain Speaker if we're going to stay focused on our mission of delivering common sense wins for the American people. We've shown Americans what success looks like when we come together as a team. Now it's time for us to stand together stronger than ever so we can get back to the work our majority was elected to do. I'm proud to support the Speaker as we continue championing conservative priorities that will put our country on a better path. Thank you, Speaker McCarthy. Gentleman from Florida. I yield back. The, the opening line of my colleague's speech was that Speaker McCarthy always overperforms expectations, but after tweeting, bring it, and after engaging in profane lace tirades at House conference, he just lost a motion to table. So I wouldn't necessarily consider that overperforming expectations. And time and again, I've heard my colleagues say that, well, he deserves it because he went through a tough speaker contest. Let me let everyone know, he prevailed in that speaker contest because he made an agreement to fulfill certain commitments to make this an open and honest process, and he has failed to meet those commitments, and that's why we are here, I reserve. Gentleman reserves his time. Gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Cole. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I yield three minutes to my very good friend, Mr. Jordan of Ohio. Gentleman from Ohio is recognized for three minutes. I thank the gentleman for yielding. On January 3rd, we said the 118th Congress is about three things. Pass the bills that need passed, do the oversight work that needs to be done, and stop the inevitable omnibus that comes from the United States Senate right before the holidays. Kevin McCarthy has been rock solid on all three. We have passed the bills we told the American people we would pass. 87,000 IRS agents, that bill, that bill passed. Parents' Bill of Rights, that bill passed. Energy legislation passed. Border security, immigration enforcement legislation, the strongest bill ever to pass the Congress, passed earlier this year. We have done what we told them we were going to do. We can't help but the Senate won't take up those good common sense bills. They'll have to answer to the American people come election day. Oversight. 
We have done the oversight that we're supposed to do. Because of our oversight, we know that parents were targeted by the Department of Justice. Because of our oversight, we know that 51 former intel officials misled the country weeks before the most important election we have. And because of our oversight, the Disinformation Governance Board at the Department of Homeland Security is gone. Because of our oversight, the memo attacking pro-life Catholics has been rescinded. Because of our oversight, unannounced visits to Americans' home by the Internal Revenue Service has stopped. That happened under Speaker McCarthy. And on the third one, on this side, of the, we know there's a big old ugly bill coming at the end of the year. All kinds of spending, all kinds of garbage in it. We're still in that fight. Frankly, to Matt's point, we don't know how that one's going to shake out. But we do know this. We do know this. On Saturday, we didn't take the Senate's bill. They tried to send over and shove it down our throats on Saturday. We didn't take that bill. And it was a tough position he was in. There were five options on the table last week. Option one was to send a long-term CR over there. That would have leveraged the 1% cut, something a bunch of us voted for, both parties. Couldn't get the votes for that one. Second option was to focus on the one issue the country now is completely focused on, the border issue. We couldn't get the votes for that one either. But when the Senate tried to send us that bill, he said no to it. I think the Speaker has kept his word. I know my colleagues and friends are saying different. I think he has kept his word on those three things that we talked about on January 3rd, and frankly, that entire week. He has kept his word. I think we should keep him as Speaker. I yield back. The gentleman from Florida is recognized. Yeah, the, the problem with my friend from Ohio's uh, argument is that many of the bills he referenced as having passed are not law. We are on a fast track to an omnibus bill, and it is difficult to champion oversight when House Republicans haven't even sent a subpoena to Hunter Biden. So it's hard to make the argument that oversight is the reason to continue when it sort of looks like failure theater. I yield such time as you may consume to my colleague from Arizona, Mr. Biggs. Gentleman from Arizona is recognized. How much time? What he con consumes. So much as he may consume. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This is a serious time. And my, my mind immediately goes to the young deputy from Cochise County, who two nights ago, while trying to apprehend a runaway vehicle smuggling humans across the border, suffered major injuries, transported to Pima County, where he's in a Tucson hospital fighting for his life. I'm talking about a border that remains wide open, where drugs come through, the Tucson sector, the most gotaways known and unknown of any sector along the border. Terrorists coming in people conducting criminal conduct coming in, criminal gang members, human smugglers, sex traffickers. They're coming across our border to the tune of hundreds of thousands every month. Now, I appreciate my colleagues and their position, but I would suggest something. I don't think you can just skip to last weekend and say, oh my goodness, a CR came out last weekend on Saturday. I think we need to go back to January. I'll say this. This body came together on the Republican side, and we passed a good border security piece of legislation, H.R. 2. That's good. And then last week, we passed the DHS bill and the DOD bills, which had funding for our CBP, ICE, military leaders, military men and women. But why did we, why were we successful in doing that? What happened to motivate us to get there? Well, for one thing, we didn't bother to pass the 12 appropriations bills as required under the Budget Control and Impounds Law of 1974. We didn't do it. And you know how many times that's not been done? 25 years in a row. And you know how many CRs this body has passed in that same period of time? 
130. You know what that gets you? A two trillion plus uh, uh, structural deficit like we had in fiscal year 23. You know what that leads you to? A $33 trillion national debt, which is where we sit today. Leads you to somewhere north of $700 billion in interest payments. And you know why that happened? Because this body is entrenched in a suboptimal path and refuses to leave it. Refuses to leave that path. You cannot change if you're unwilling to change. We had every opportunity to change. We were promised change. We were promised we were going to go ahead and we were going to get those 12 bills done. And if we got those 12 bills done, do you know why you do 12 bills? Because it allows you to reduce spending, get rid of wasteful, duplicative programs. It allows you to set an agenda to restore fiscal sanity. We chose to not do it again. We were promised we'd do it. That's why at the end, some people said, we'll vote present. We'll go ahead. We're going to put our trust in Mr. McCarthy to become the speaker. That didn't happen. I suspected that would be the case. That was my struggle. That was my struggle last November and December. I iterated it to this body, our conference anyway. When we got to the debt ceiling, again, that seemed to spring upon everybody like a surprise. And when that happened, I was in there for some of those negotiations on where that number would be. And I was astonished how that 1.5 trillion number was negotiated. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. But I will tell you this. To his credit, the speaker told us one thing that I believe to be true. He said that that's basically the ante in a poker game. He can sit down at the table. And I told my colleagues who supported that, that $1.5 trillion in eight months that you're willing to raise the debt ceiling, that's the opening marker. And indeed it was. And now projections are many trillion dollars above that. Yes, I think it's time to, con to make a change. I'm not the only one. And that's it's somber. Thus it is somber. But what have we failed to accomplish? Why, why didn't we get this stuff done? When we're, when we're campaigning, we're talking about an extension of the debt ceiling to January of 2025. We're talking about additional Ukraine funding. Is that going to be, maybe that's good in your districts. Maybe it's not. But that money's not offset. We're not paying for it. We haven't designated how we're going to pay for that. The same with the disaster package. The IRS remains 80% increased. And I would tell you, I could, get, I, will go, I could go down the list, but I will just tell you why this happens. When you don't do your 12 budget bills, and you rely ultimately on a CR, and I'll get to the calendar in a second, what happens is you cannot leverage this administration to actually enforce the border laws that you need to have enforced. This is a lawless Biden regime. They will not enforce border laws. And we can pass them until we're blue in the face. But until you leverage the budget and the spending, you will not see enforcement by, these, by this, this administration. So now take a look at the calendar that, the, that we were just provided last week. We're supposed, to finish, we're supposed to finish by November 3rd our 12 bills. By November 17th, that's when we're supposed to see that the conference committees have come together, both sides, and we've resolved this. I don't believe that that's going to happen. It wasn't going to happen before. You were, you were betting on the come again. At some point, 
I'd urge you to stop betting on the come and bet on the reality. That's why I can't support the speaker any longer. I'll be uh, voting for the motion to vacate. Yield back. Reserve. Gentleman yields back his time. Gentleman from Florida. Reserves. Reserves. Members are advised to direct your comments to the chair, please. Gentleman from Oklahoma. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I yield two minutes to my very good friend from Arkansas, Mr. Westerman. Gentleman from Arkansas, Mr. Westerman is recognized for two minutes. Sela, S-E-L-A-H, Sela. This unique word scattered throughout the Psalms signals to the reader to pause, reflect, consider, and maybe take a deep breath before moving on. Psalmist used Selah to emphasize the significance of a statement. For example, King David wrote, Blessed be the Lord who daily bears our burden, the God who is our salvation, Selah. That is a profound statement with huge implications. It deserves more than a cursory consideration. Within the next hour, this House will vote yea or nay to vacate the Speaker's chair, a profound action with huge implications. This was last tried in 1910. Joseph Cannon won the vote. 113 years later, my office is in the Cannon office building, and Uncle Joe Cannon's statue sits just outside this chamber. No living human has taken the vote we're about to take. It deserves that we pause, we reflect, that we consider deeply the ramification of our actions. To my fellow Republicans who would consider voting yes, to removing our Republican speaker, please pause and ask yourself two questions. Will your yes vote make America stronger? Will your yes vote strengthen conservative policies? If you believe yes is the right vote, please stand before this body and the American people and articulate your plan, not your grievances or your wishes, your plan. Convince the mass majority of the Republican conference that strongly disagrees with you to follow you. If you cannot do that, which you have failed to do so far, then voting yes is at the least a disruptive overreaction. In reality, it's selfish, bad for conservative policies, and bad for America. That's why I strongly support Speaker Kevin McCarthy and why, without hesitation or reservation, I will vote no on this disastrous resolution. I yield back. Gentlemen from Florida. There's nothing selfish about wanting a Speaker of the House who tells the truth. I reserve. Gentleman reserves his time. Gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Cole. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I yield two minutes to my very good friend from Kentucky and fellow member of the Rules Committee, Mr. Massey. The gentleman from Kentucky, Mr. Massey, is recognized for two minutes. Mr. Speaker, as the only still serving co-author and co-sponsor of the motion to vacate Speaker Boehner, I can tell you this motion to vacate is a terrible idea. As the only member who's serving here who took every chance to vote against Speaker Boehner and to vote against Speaker Ryan, I can tell you that this chamber has, run, has been run better more conservatively and more transparently under Mr. McCarthy than any other speaker that I have served under. As a member of the Rules Committee, one, one of three, one of three conservatives who were placed there out of trust, the speaker gave us a blocking position by putting three of us on there to keep an eye on the Rules Committee, to make sure the process was fair and even. I can tell you it's been fair and even. None of us are voting against the speaker today. Regular order is at odds with predetermined outcomes. Yet the speaker is, is being accused of not holding to regular order and predetermined outcomes at the same time. It is not possible. You cannot be for both at the same time. I was a party to the January agreement, and I can tell you that there were promises in there, but, but there was never a promise for an outcome. There was never a promise that you could force Joe Biden to sign something. There was only the promise that we would try, and try we have. We have tried in the Rules Committee. We have tried on the floor. We've been trying this since this summer, and there's enough blame to go around for why we don't have 12 bills, but part of it was a relitigation of the debt limit deal. By the way, there was no promise on the debt limit deal, no conditions on that in January, zero whatsoever. 
I was in the room for that. So the 12 bills were delayed over what? $100 billion. That's a lot of money. But it's nothing compared to the $2 trillion that I came here to object to when Speaker Pelosi and President Trump pushed that bill through. We've had over 500 amendments. Listen, this is a, this is a referendum on this institution. We have tried regular order. Speaker McCarthy has tried regular order. If regular order fails today, if you vacate the Speaker, Fire. nobody is going to try it again. time has expired. This institution will fail. Please do not vacate the Speaker. Gentleman from Florida. I reserve. Gentleman from Florida reserves his time. Gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Cole. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. I yield two minutes to my very good friend from California, Mr. McClintock. Gentleman from California, Mr. McClintock, is recognized for two minutes. Mr. Speaker, if there was ever a time for sobriety, wisdom, and caution in this House, it is right now. If this motion carries, the, the House will be paralyzed. We can expect week after week of fruitless ballots while no other business can be conducted. The Democrats will revel in Republican dysfunction, and the public will rightly be repulsed. It will end when the Democrats are able to enlist a rump caucus of Republicans to join a coalition to end the impasse. This House will shift dramatically to the left and will effectively end Republican House majority that the voters elected in 2022, and this in turn will neutralize the only counterweight in our elected government to the woke left's control of the Senate and the White House at a time when their policies are destroying our economy and have opened our borders to invasion. There are turning points in history whose significance is only realized by the events that they unleash. This is one of those times. We are at the precipice. There are only minutes left to come to our senses and realize the grave danger our country is in at this moment. Dear God, grant us the wisdom to see it and to save our country from it. Gentlemen from Florida. Mr. Speaker, there is nothing sober, wise, or cautious about the path we are on. We are a, on a path to financial ruin if this do House does not take a different posture, a different procedure, and yield toward different outcomes and a better future. I reserve. Gentleman reserves his time. Gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Cole. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I yield one and a half minutes to my very good friend from Florida, uh, Mr. Jimenez. One and a half minutes. Uh, gentleman from Florida is recognized for one and one half minutes. I stand before my colleagues uh, in the nation as a proud representative of the great state of Florida. I truly am beyond blessed to represent my, the paradise that is Miami-Dade County and the Florida Keys. And I am beyond uh, proud of the, to represent my community before this Congress to stand with a leader who has consistently demonstrated an unwavering commitment to our country and to the principles that define us as Americans, Kevin McCarthy. Today is historic for a lot of reasons. For, for one thing, this is the first time in over 100 years as this has been attempted. But it's also because we're part of a Congress with historically tight majorities for the Republicans in the House and the Democrats in the Senate, and we have a Democratic White House, divided government. That's what we have. The need to negotiate, to find solutions to the issues facing this country, that's, uh, that's a reflection of the principles that are uniquely American, principles that make this country exceptional, and principles that allowed me, an exile who came here from Cuba, fleeing communist Cuba, to serve in this very institution. You see. I wasn't born here, and everything, but everything that I am, everything that I ever will be, uh, is thanks to America. The best part about it is that my story, the story of the, com the community that I'm so proud to represent, is a story of many in this body, is that we are, not, we are not the exception in America, we are the rule. That's the America that Kevin McCarthy has fought for his entire career. Kevin McCarthy is a champion for the American dream, and he's proved it as our speaker. Thomas Jefferson once said, I predict future happiness for Americans if they can prevent the government from wasting the labors of the people under the guise of taking care of them. McCarthy. Gentlemen's time has expired. Thank you. Let's keep Kevin McCarthy our speaker. A great man, a great leader, a great speaker. Thank you, and I yield back. 
Gentleman from Florida, Mr. Mr. Gates. Mr. Speaker, may I inquire as to my remaining time? Gentleman has nine and three quarter minutes remaining. I reserve. Gentleman reserves his time. Gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Cole. Much, Mr. Speaker. I yield one and a half minutes to my very good friend from Iowa, the gentlelady, Ms. Henson. The gentlelady from Iowa, Ms. Henson, is recognized for one and one half minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today in support of our Speaker, Kevin McCarthy. Let's be very clear here. We would not have a House Republican majority without the relentless efforts of this man, our Speaker. Under his leadership, Joe Biden's policies have had a check and balance. His policies have created a horrific border crisis, 10,000 illegal immigrants a day surging across our border. Under Speaker McCarthy, Republicans have passed legislation to secure our border. Joe Biden has done everything to squash American energy, selling our oil reserves to China. Under Speaker McCarthy, Republicans have passed legislation to unleash American energy dominance. Joe Biden has spent taxpayer dollars like there's no tomorrow. Under Speaker McCarthy, we have returned to passing single subject appropriations bills and ending the status quo of omnibus spending. One of the most valuable pieces of advice that I received was from Kevin McCarthy when I got here to D.C. He told me to separate the signal from the noise. The noise is those who are causing chaos for their own personal benefit while ignoring the needs of their constituents and this country, grinding our work here to a halt. The signal is the many accomplishments that we've delivered for the American people with Speaker McCarthy at the helm. The signal is the failures coming out of the White House time and time again. The signal is the work that we must do today and going forward to save our country for my kids and yours. My colleagues today here have a choice. Be a chaos agent or get back to work. So I call on my colleagues. Let's separate the signal from the noise. Let's support our speaker, Kevin McCarthy, so we can get back to work for the American people. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I yield back. Gentleman from Florida, Mr. Gates. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I think I've caught the signal, too. The signal is for $33 trillion in debt facing $2.2 trillion annual deficits. And our fellow Americans may be watching, wondering, how does that happen? How does the greatest country in the world have a process so broken that it would be laughed out of the rooms in the halls of the state legislatures where many of us come from? Here's how it works. The law says we're supposed to have the very single subject spending bills that my colleague referenced in the summer. That we're supposed to have that and move it. But there's a dirty little secret in this town, and that is if you delay if you hold the bills, if you make multiple contradictory promises, as Speaker McCarthy has done, and you back everybody up against shutdown politics, well, nobody wants to shut the government down. No one cheers for a shutdown. And of course, when people are backed up against shutdown politics, the decision calculus changes. So year after year, decade after decade, we break the law and we do the same thing. We pass a continuing resolution, then we pass another continuing resolution, and then it's either another continuing resolution or an omnibus bill or a series of minibuses that lump these disparate things together. The American people want all of us to take votes on single subject matters. They don't want to see these things all mushed together and log rolled. And it was concerning to me to hear of news of a secret deal on Ukraine funding that would have log rolled more money with Ukraine with our southern border. Now, how offensive is that to our Customs and Border Patrol, to our ICE, to the people that are suffering as a consequence of our border, that some of my colleagues are only willing to stand up and fight for our border if they could send billions to Ukraine to fund their border, too? Well, I've had enough of that, and that's why I brought this motion to vacate. I reserve. Gentleman's time is reserved. Gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Cole. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. I yield one minute to our distinguished majority leader, my good friend from Louisiana, Mr. Scalise. Gentleman from Louisiana, the majority leader, Mr. Scalise, is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank my friend from Oklahoma for yielding. And when we go back to January, as many people have, we knew that it was going to be a narrow majority. We also knew that it wasn't going to be easy. How many of us came here because we thought this job was going to be easy? How many of us thought the task ahead of us to address the problems of this country was going to be easy? One thing we did know is that if we were going to finally start confronting problems that had been ignored for years and years and years, we had to change the way that this place worked. 
And one thing Speaker McCarthy embraced from day one is to start making those kind of changes to this institution, opening up the process, allowing members to be more engaged, having amendments come to the floor, single subject bills, doing appropriations bills. Yes, making that happen overnight is not something that happens automatically. But it started to happen, and we are now seeing the fruits of it. Just last week, we had four different appropriations bills on this House floor, four different ones. Now, those bills took weeks and weeks to finally get to the floor, going through an open committee process, hundreds of amendments, each one of them, where Republicans, Democrats could bring their ideas. And we debated those bills on the floor, some until after midnight where members could actually participate in the process. This has been a broken process for a long time, but it's a process where we, if we're going to confront the problems that families are facing, because right now we need to resolve our differences inside this House chamber before we can then go and fight for those families who are struggling. But every single day across America, families are struggling with real problems that we're gonna have to get back to solving. And those problems are real for them. It's inflation, it's the economy, it's high energy costs. It's an open southern border that doesn't just affect the border states, it's affecting every state, Republican districts, Democrat districts, everybody knows it. And it can be ignored by the White House, but this House is the only body that started to take action. When we with HR2, and then with the border bill last week, and with over the action we took last week, over 70% of government funding passed out of the House. However, everybody voted, Republican or Democrat, this House passed funding for over 70% of the federal government's operation, and it's sitting over in the Senate where they've passed zero. And we're going to beat up each other and talk about our internal processes, and we need to get our internal processes working better. But you know what? So does that other body over there, and so does the White House. Everybody in this town needs to be engaged in addressing these problems. But if we don't start here, and if we don't focus these next 45 days, because that's what we've got in front of us. We've got two bills this week. We've got two more appropriations bills next week. And if we're going to be confronting those, we've got to stay focused on our mission. What the other side does, let's continue to put pressure on them. But we also need to put pressure on ourselves to do our job. And Speaker McCarthy's been leading at the top of the level to make sure that we have the tools to do our jobs in a different way than the House has done it before. This House is going to have to continue to make those changes. But the American people sent us here to confront those problems. We're finally starting to. This isn't the time to slow that process down. We need to keep doing our work. We need to keep fighting for those families who are struggling. But so does the Senate, and so does the White House as well. Let's keep doing this work that we were sent here to do. I yield back. Gentleman from Florida is recognized with seven and three quarter minutes remaining. Mr. Cole commands 12 and one half minutes left in this debate. Gentleman from Florida. I agree with everything that the majority leader said in those remarks, except one thing. It is astonishing to hear any colleague give Speaker McCarthy credit for moving on to the single subject appropriations bills. As you heard my colleague, Mr. Biggs, say, that was never the plan from Speaker McCarthy. The week before we moved on to those single subject appropriations bills, the plan was another CR. He pitched a CR. They tried to get us to vote for a CR, and only when a brave few said, we are done governing by continuing resolution, we are here to eulogize the era of continuing resolution, we will not do it, we will not pass it. These bills can go, the spending may rise and fall as the years pass, but the notion that we're going to lump in the Department of Education and the Department of Labor with our military and our troops and our Border Patrol is fundamentally unserious and I would suggest chaotic. We cannot do that. It was only because we forced that to happen. And by the way, if we continue with Speaker McCarthy, the appropriations process will go right back to what he wanted it to go back to. Just a sideshow, just a puppet show, just something to keep the hamsters on the hamster wheel as they continue to back people up against a calendar, 
centralized power with the lobbyists and special interests that move all kind of money through the leadership, and then that's how they get their way, and that's why the American people have been getting screwed decade after decade, and I'm not going to tolerate it anymore without a fight. I reserve. Gentleman's time is reserved. Gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Cole. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I yield two minutes to my very good friend, fellow member of the Appropriations Committee, Mr. Garcia of California. Gentleman from California, Mr. Garcia is recognized for two minutes. Mr. Speaker, I want to recalibrate our minds on what is actually happening here today. This proceeding looks important, it feels consequential, but let's look what out at what else is happening across America. Today about 300 Americans will die from fentanyl poisoning. Today about 11,000 people will illegally penetrate our borders. Today's debt is approaching $34 trillion. Today's mortgage rates just hit a 25-year high, now approaching 8%. Our energy prices are again at back-breaking highs with, approach, with gas approaching $8 a gallon in my district. Today, China and the CCP grow stronger with an intent to go to war by 2027, and our military is exp experiencing record low retention and record low recruitment. This is the reality of today for 335 million Americans under President Joe Biden. It's a dark and scary reality. This Republican majority here today in the House is the only firewall against the damaging far-left policies of the Biden administration. The single-subject appropriation bills that we were supposed to be voting on this week will literally fight to reverse the darkness of these realities and fight inflation, cut spending, secure our border while enhancing our nation's security and investing in our soldiers at a meaningful level. But today, this body filled with people in fancy suits, led by a few Republicans who are running with scissors and supported by Democrats, <laughs> who have personal issues with the Speaker, have uncertain intentions and even more uncertain goals. And they've decided to make today about drama, not about solving problems and helping our constituents, but about drama. We need to be the no drama option for America, this party, this majority, and I fear that this self-inflicted drama of today jeopardizes our majority and by definition removes the last layer of defense protecting America from this Biden administration. Let's dispense with the drama, do our jobs, and move on with defending this beautiful country. I yield back. Thanks. Gentlemen from Florida. Yeah, I'm here to solve problems too, but we have decade after decade of history showing us that you don't solve any problems with continuing resolutions and omnibus bills. That creates more problems, more debt, more inflation, more pain for American families. So the way to solve problems is to break the fever dream of governing by continuing resolution and omnibus bill and instead return to the very single subject spending bills that we will only get if my resolution passes to vacate Speaker McCarthy. I reserve. Gentleman reserves his time. Gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Cole. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. I yield two minutes to my very good friend from North Carolina, Mr. McHenry. Gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. McHenry, is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Every step of the way, Speaker McCarthy has been doubted. <clears throat> after the first Speaker vote, he was mocked, right? And after 15, they called him Speaker. And even then, it was the media and the left that mocked him. With the narrowest Republican majority in a generation, what do we achieve? We brought the President to the table when he stubbornly said for 100 days they would not negotiate on the debt ceiling. I took him his word. The Speaker said, no, we'll get him to the table. And sure enough, we did. The result? The most conservative spending package we've seen in generations. The largest spending cuts year over year that any Congress has passed. Conservative outcomes. So I understand your position on the left. I understand that. But my friends on the right, why? And then this past weekend, so I understand the frustration on the left at what happened on the continuing resolution. But why would we have conservatives object to that? Why will we have House members object to that? We rolled the Senate. We never roll the Senate as a House. Moreover, we never roll the Senate to get less spending, and we got it this weekend. So I understand why the left is mad. What I don't understand is why some Republicans think that that's a bad thing. The frustration for me today, I understand where the liberals are. I know you can support the constitutional order, except in a moment like this when you are questioned on that. I understand that. You can't be counted on in a moment like this with the state of the speakership. 
But for Republicans, why would we give up a conservative working majority for better outcomes and hand the keys over to the Democrats? Why would we do that? And furthermore, with this record of success that we've seen Kevin McCarthy and a Republican majority produce in a Washington run by Democrats, we're going to throw that away, resulting in more liberal outcomes, not more conservative ones. So I understand why the left is where you are today. You don't like an effective conservative majority, and I don't blame you. But on the right, Gentlemen's time has expired. This. <clears throat> Gentleman from Florida. <clears throat> it is lovely to hear from the principal architect of Mr. McCarthy's debt limit deal, but here's the reality. The only Republicans in America who believe that the debt limit deal was conservative are in this chamber right now. Because all over America, Republicans think that when you negotiated that debt limit deal, they took your lunch money. I reserve. Gentleman reserves his time. Gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Cole. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I yield one and a half minutes to my very good friend from my home state, Gentlelady uh, Ms. Bice. Gentlelady from Oklahoma, Ms. Bice is recognized for one and one half minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today in support of Speaker Kevin McCarthy. Under his leadership and a very small five-seat majority, House Republicans have achieved, contrary to popular belief, numerous victories. We passed the Parents' Bill of Rights, the Lower Energy Costs Act to lower the cost of gasoline and restore American energy independence. The Fiscal Responsibility Act, which was one of the largest enacted cuts with enforceable spending caps in American history. And H.R. 2, the most conservative southern border security bill history in history. All of this while fully funding our military and our nation's veterans. Let me be abundantly clear. Attempting to remove Speaker McCarthy will put this House in a stalemate and paralyze our ability to fight for our constituents and instead create a fight amongst one another. We have 43 days to restore fiscal responsibility and advance conservative appropriations priorities which is exactly what my colleagues have asked for. Instead, we are threatening any House proceedings. This is an unnecessary distraction. Working together under the leadership of Speaker McCarthy is of the utmost importance. I stand and strongly support Kevin McCarthy for Speaker of the House, and I encourage my Republican colleagues to do the same. Thank you, and I yield. Mr. Cole continues to uh, reserve his time. He has seven minutes remaining. Mr. Gates controls five and one half in this one hour debate. The gentleman from Florida is recognized. I'll reserve. Gentleman reserves. Gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Cole. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. I yield two minutes to my very good friend and our distinguished conference leader, Ms. Stefanik of New York. The gentlelady from New York, Ms. Stefanik, is recognized for two minutes. Anyone and everyone who knows Kevin McCarthy, whether they are friend or foe, knows that Kevin McCarthy is a happy warrior. He is tireless. He has that uniquely American grit. Under Kevin's speakership that lasted 15 rounds of him never giving up, this Republican majority has exceeded all expectations. We reopened the People's House. We passed the strongest border security bill in our nation's history. We passed an energy plan to unleash American energy dominance. We passed defense bills to support our troops. Under Kevin's leadership, he's brought hundreds and hundreds of bipartisan members of Congress to Israel, our greatest ally. He elected the most diverse class of Republicans ever with the largest number of Republican women ever in American history. This boy from Bakersfield, he cares deeply about his constituents, his country, and the American people. And that includes each and every one of his colleagues. He's been to our districts, Gentlelady will suspend. Our weddings, celebrated the birth of our children, and the has cheered us when we haven't believed in ourselves, which is why the Republicans strongly support Speaker McCarthy and are proud he is our speaker. And I yield back. Gentlelady. It was not the intent to cut the gentlelady off, except that we have too much chatter going on in the House chamber. Every member deserves to be heard. So if you have private conversations you need to have, please take them from the floor.
gentlelady may continue. As I have said, this speaker has been to our districts. He has toasted at our weddings. He has celebrated the birth of our children, mourned the loss of our loved ones. Now more than ever, the Republicans must unify. The stakes are too high. We need to save our country, which is why this conference is proud to strongly support Kevin McCarthy as Speaker of the House. I yield back. Gentlelady or gentleman from Florida. I would just say if this House of Representatives has exceeded all expectations, then we definitely need higher expectations. <laughs> and while it's heartwarming and kind that the speaker calls people on their birthday and visits their district and congratulates them on their children, please know this isn't a critique of the individual, it's a critique of the job. The job hasn't been done. We've had multi multiple contradictory promises. And it's just quite something, for those of you keeping track at home, the last three speakers you've heard opposing my resolution all voted for the debt deal. So like, if you believe that the debt limit deal that Speaker McCarthy brought into law was a good thing, maybe you agree with their perspective. I think the debt limit deal was a terrible deal, and that's one of the reasons, it really was the original sin of the McCarthy speakership, and it's one of the reasons I seek to vacate the chair now. I reserve. Gentlemen, time is reserved. Gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Cole. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I yield two minutes to my very good friend from the great state of Louisiana, Mr. Graves. Gentleman from Louisiana, Mr. Graves, is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the gentleman from Oklahoma for yielding. Mr. Speaker, we've been here for eight months with one of the tightest majorities in modern history. Yet, look at the accomplishments of this majority, this conservative majority, with the majority of Republicans voting for, the strongest border security in my lifetime, fighting against this incomprehensible energy policy that's driving up energy costs 40 percent, utility and gasoline payments, pushing Americans into energy poverty. We passed legislation to unleash America's energy resources, pushing back this administration's brainless policies on, on energy. We've passed legislation to pull back, to stop spending $4.8 trillion. Then I want to make note, my friends that are carrying this motion to vacate opposed. We've, we've passed legislation to streamline regulations, permitting, environmental laws for the first time in 40 years. Again, my friends here opposed. We strengthened work requirements for welfare to get people back into the workforce. Again, my friends over here opposed. I keep wondering, what is going on? Are we redefining what conservative is? What's going on in this country today? What's going on in this body? We have Freedom Works Heritage, Chip Roy and Jim Jordan say something's conservative, and these folks say it's not, and they're right. And all of a sudden, my phone keeps sending text messages. Text messages saying, hey, give me money. Oh, look at that. Oh, look, give me money. I filed the motion to vacate. Using official actions, official actions to raise money. It's disgusting. It's what's disgusting about Washington. Mr. Speaker, we've watched as these folks right here that have brought up this motion to vacate have refused to pay our military service members. Refused to pay them. I want to quote my delegation member, my senator from Louisiana, John Kennedy. If we're not going to pay our service members, if, we're, if they're not going to be there to protect us, next time someone invades America, call a crackhead. Let me know how that works out for you. Yield the gentleman another 30 seconds. The gentleman is recognized for an additional 30 seconds. Mr. Speaker, I've heard people talk about bad faith here. I've heard them make reference to this January agreement. My friends from Arizona, Virginia, and Florida. Let me be crystal clear. Not a single one of them were in the room. You know what? You know what? The Speaker didn't, didn't meet the targets of that January agreement. He exceeded them. The greatest savings in American history. The greatest savings in American history. Mr. Speaker, this isn't about fundraising. This is about our country. It's about our children and our grandchildren. We need to stand behind the swimmers well, 30 majority. Seconds. We need to stand behind the greatest seconds. speaker in modern history that has delivered the best conservative wins for this country. I yield back.
<clears throat> the gentleman from Florida. My colleague says we've passed the strongest border bills in history. Well, guess what? Look at the border right now. We didn't use sufficient leverage in the debt limit or in any other thing to actually get results on the border. The border is a disaster, really something I don't think you're going to be campaigning on that you fix the border. Second, you said you streamlined regulations. What the gentleman from Louisiana doesn't tell you is that all of the regulatory reform he was just bragging about is waivable by the stroke of a pen of someone in the Biden White House. Do you really think you got anything for that? It's a total joke. And then finally, the welfare to work that the gentleman from Louisiana said we got. The welfare programs that they said that they streamlined with their welfare to work stuff, they're actually going to grow. Because while they did work requirements, they blew out those programs with expanded eligibility. I'm real glad you guys didn't put work requirements on Medicaid. It probably would have resulted in Medicaid expansion. And when it comes to how those raise money, I take no lecture on asking patriotic Americans to weigh in and contribute to this fight from those who would grovel and bend knee for the lobbyists and special interests who own our leadership, who have, oh, boo all you want, who have hollowed out this town and have borrowed against the future of our future generations. I'll be happy to fund my political operation through the work of hardworking Americans, 10 and 20 and $30 at a time, and you all keep showing up at the lobbyist fundraisers and see how that goes for you. I reserve. Once again, the chair would admonish those speaking from the floor to direct their comments to the chair. Gentleman from Oklahoma. Mr. Speaker, I would inquire as to how much time remains for each side. From Oklahoma controls three minutes. The gentleman from Florida has three minutes as well. Uh, I advise the gentleman from Florida I'm prepared to close if he is. Mr. Speaker, I yield the balance of my time to my great uh, friend from North Dakota, Mr. Armstrong. Gentleman from North Dakota, Mr. Armstrong, is recognized with the remaining three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Let's be clear why we're here. Because the incentive structure in this town is completely broken. We no longer value loyalty, integrity, competence or collaboration. Instead, we have descended to a place where clicks, TV hits, and the never-ending quest for the most mediocre taste of celebrity drives decisions and encourages juvenile behavior that is so far beneath this esteemed body. Kevin McCarthy has done more in nine months to restore the People's House than any speaker in decades. We have done regular order. We have out had open amendments. And every single member of this chamber has the right, the ability, and the opportunity to be heard on the floor. It's been messy, it's been raucous, and at times it's been chaotic. And God bless every minute of it, because democracy is supposed to be hard. And because the alternative is a closed door process where 2,000 page bills come out of the speaker's office at midnight and are forced to the floor the next morning. Kevin McCarthy has broken that cycle. That alone is enough for him to remain our speaker. But that doesn't deliver our, his opponents what they crave the most, attention. We shouldn't stand for it. I won't stand for it. I will stand here with our speaker, with our leader, that the overwhelming majority of our Congress supports. And you need to look no further than where the opponents are sitting today in this chamber. They're not over here, they're over there. So we're going to face these challenges together, and I say bring whatever comes next, because we believe in the job you have done, Mr. Speaker. We believe in your, your vision, and most importantly, we are proud to call Kevin McCarthy our friend and our Speaker of the House. And with that, I yield back. The gentleman yields back his time. The gentleman from Florida is recognized with three minutes remaining. To be clear, I tried to get one of the three podiums on the Republican side, and y'all wouldn't let me have them, so he sent me over here. But you know what? I'll make this argument at any desk in this building, from the well, from the chair. I'll make it on every street corner in this country that Washington must change. 
We have to break the cycle. We have to break the fever. And I would hope, truly, that the reforms that we are fighting for are reforms that would last and be embraced and that would democratize power in this institution beyond the privileged few who back us up against shutdown politics and, and Christmases and deadlines in order to achieve their objectives. Mr. Speaker, high inflation is on the verge of bankrupting American families. Our economy is breaking in half. A typical American family can't afford to buy a house in 99% of U.S. counties. Inflation is stealing more than $700 a month from working Americans, nearly $9,000 a year. Kevin McCarthy is the Speaker of the House of Representatives, and he has failed to take a stand where it matters. So if he won't, I will. I make no apologies for defending the right of every hardworking American to afford a decent life for themselves and their families. And we have a greater opportunity to do that and to build coalitions under new leadership. We have to rip off the Band-Aid. We have to get back on a better course. And Mr. Speaker, I don't know how this vote's going to go. Usually when a vote comes to this floor, it's pretty predetermined. And this one, I'm not so sure. But I am sure that we've made the right argument that this place deserves single subject spending bills, that we should have 72 hours to read a bill, that something that spends more than $100 million shouldn't be put on the suspension agenda such that we can't amend it, and there shouldn't be secret side deals made on a continuing resolution to lump Ukraine in with border security. That is, a, that is not right for Ukraine or border security because it fails to give either of those issues the dignity that they would require. But we can return that dignity to this House. We can get back on a better path. We can have single subject appropriations bills. We can set a budget, a budget top line. We haven't had a budget in this place since I was in high school. So let's get a budget. Let's get our act together. Let's get on with it. Let's vacate the chair and let's get a better speaker. I yield back. Gentleman yields back his time. All time for debate has expired. Without objection, the previous question is ordered on the resolution. The question is on adoption of the resolution. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. no. The noes have it. The re resolution is, gentlemen from Florida. I'd request the yeas and nays. The yeas and nays are requested. Those favoring a vote by the yeas and nays will rise. A sufficient number having risen, the yeas and nays are ordered. Pursuant to Clause 3 of Rule 20, the Chair directs the Clerk to conduct the vote by a call of the roll. The Clerk will call the roll alphabetically by surname. The House will be in order. The clerk may call the roll. Adams. Yes. Yay. Adderholt. No. Nay. Aguilar, Aye. yay. Alford, no. nay. Allen, no. nay. Allred, Aye. yay. Emma Day, no. nay. Armstrong, no. no. Arrington, nay. Auchincloss, yay. Babin, nay. Bacon, nay. Baird, nay. Balderson, no. nay. Ballant, yes. 
Yay. Banks. Banks. Bar. No. Nay. Barrigan. Yes. Barrigan. Yay. Bean of Florida. No. Nay. Beatty. Yes. Yay. Bents. No. Nay. Barra. Yes. Yay. Bergman. No. Nay. Buyer. Yay. Yay. Bice. Yes. Nay. Biggs. Aye. Yay. Billarakis. Oh. Nay. Reporting uh, some, you know, recent outreach by those individual House members to uh, their Democratic counterpart, counterparts. You mentioned some of this already, but walk us through this day. You're talking about Jeffries, you know, saying that the Democrats would not help to save McCarthy. But when the day began, that was still an open question, right? We didn't know that until about midday today. It was very much an open question. In fact, we didn't even know that this vote would be held today. McCarthy had the option to schedule it any time within the next 48 hours or so, but he apparently decided at some point this morning to rip off the Band-Aid. It was interesting watching these dueling interviews this morning from McCarthy and Jeffries around 8 o'clock, where they were both sort of saying they were going to talk to their members and let the chips fall where they may. McCarthy said that he and Jeffries had spoken last night. Neither men would detail the conversation. We know they have a much better relationship than their predecessors had had. But uh, no one would say exactly what went on in that conversation. And then Democrats and Republicans each huddled behind closed doors. Democrats for nearly two hours, which each member, dozens and dozens of members speaking about McCarthy. And it became very clear there was no one who was going to defend McCarthy in that room. Now, they may have their issues with this process. McCarthy, you, you know, one could argue, may be better to work with because he's the devil they know. But none of those arguments carried any weight with House Democrats who came out saying, we don't trust him. Uh, and, you know, the, the, he's not our person to save, basically. And that's been the overwhelming consensus among Democrats today. We'll see now where the rubber meets the road here in terms of this vote, whether anyone changes their view when their name is called. Uh, but there was every indication leaving that conference uh, meeting this morning, which sounded like a pep rally at times from the outside. The Democrats were going to stick behind their leader, Hakeem Jeffries, in this latest unprecedented historic moment on the House floor. You know, Garrett, uh, we're going to come right back to you uh, shortly, I'm sure. Um, but first, I'm joined now by Republican Congressman uh, David Valadeo. And, oh, uh, sorry, <laughs> some technical difficulties here. We're going to uh, bring in uh, the panel here. Uh, former uh, Senator Doug Jones is here, and I'm also joined by Deepa Shivram, political reporter at NPR, former Democratic Senator from Alabama, Doug Jones, and also Stephen Hayes, editor and CEO of The Dispatch and an NBC News uh, contributor. Also, um, I think we're going Cardenas. Yeah. Yay. Carey. Nay. Carl. Nay. Carson. Aye. Yay. Carter of Georgia. Nay. Carter of Louisiana. Yes. Yay. Carter of Texas. Carter of Texas. Cartwright. Yay. Kassar. Yes. Yay. Case. Yay. Caston. Yes. Yay. Castor of Florida. Yay. Castro of Texas. Yes. Yay. Chavez de Reamer. No. Nay. Sharfalis McCormick. 
Yay. Chu. Yay. Cisco Mani. Nay. Clark of Massachusetts. Yay. Clark of New York. Yay. Cleaver. Yay. Klein. Nay. Cloud. Nay. Clyburn. Yay. Clyde. Nay. Cohen. Yay. Cole. Nay. Collins. Nay. Comer. Nay. Connolly. Yay. Correa. Yes. Yay. Costa. Yay. Courtney. Yay. Craig. Yay. Crane. Yay. Crawford. Nay. Crenshaw. Nay. Crockett. Yay. Crow. Yay. Quayar. Yay. Curtis. Nay. Davis of Kansas. Yay. Davidson. Nay. Davis of Illinois. Davis of Illinois, yay. Yay. Davis of North Carolina. Aye. Yay. Dean of Pennsylvania. Yay. To get. Yes. Yay. Dela Cruz. No. Nay. Deloro. Yes. Yay. Del Bene. Aye. Yay. Deluzio. Yes. Yay. Yes. Yay. Desjolais. No. Nay. Diaz Pizzito. No. Nay. Diaz Ballart. No. Nay. Dingle. Yay. Doggett. Yay. Donalds. No. Nay. Duarte. No. No, nay. Duncan. No. Nay. Dunn of Florida. No. Nay. Edwards. No. Nay. Elsie. No. Nay. Emmer. Nay. Escobar. Yay. Eshu. Yay. Espayat. Yay. Estes. Nay. Evans. Yes. Yay. Azel. No. Nay. Fallon. Nay. Nay. Finstra. No. Nay. Ferguson. 
No. Finstad? No. Nay. Fishbach? No. Nay. Fitzgerald? No. Nay. Fitzpatrick? No. Nay. Fleischman? No. Nay. Fletcher? Yes. Yay. Flood? Nay. Foster? Yay. Fushi? Yay. Fox? Nay. Nay. Lois Frankel? Yay. C. Scott Franklin? Nay. Frost? Yes. Yay. Fry? No. Nay. Fulcher? Nay. Gates? Yes. Yay. Gallagher? No. Nay. Gallego? Aye. Yay. Garamendi? Yes. Yay. Garbarino? No. Nay. Mike Garcia? No. Nay. Robert Garcia? Yay. Yay. Garcia of Illinois? Yay. Yay. Garcia of Texas? Garcia of Texas goes yes. Yay. Jimenez? No. Nay. Golden of Maine? Yes. Yay. Goldman of New York? Aye. Yay. Gomez? Yay. Tony Gonzalez. Tony Gonzalez. Vicente Gonzalez. Yay. Yay. Good of Virginia. Yay. Gooden of Texas. Gooden of Texas. Gosar. No. Nay. Gottheimer. No. Yay. Granger. No. Nay. Graves of Louisiana. No. Nay. Graves of Missouri. Nay. Green of Tennessee. No. Nay. Green of Texas. Well, the many denied their right to vote again. Yay. Green of Georgia. Nay. Griffith. No. Nay. Grijalva. Yay. Yay. Grothman? No. Nay. Guest? No. Nay. Guthrie? No. Nay. Hageman? No. No. Harder of California? Aye. Yay. Harris? No. Nay. Harshbarger? Nay. Hayes. Yes. Yay. Hearn. Nay. Higgins of Louisiana. No. Nay. Higgins of New York. Yay. Hill. Nay. Himes, yay. Henson, 
Nay. Horsford. Aye. Yay. Houchin. No. Nay. Houlihan. Yeah. Yay. Hoyer. Yeah. Hoyer. Yeah. Yay. Hoyle of Oregon. Aye. Yay. Hudson. No. Nay. Huffman. Yes. Yay. Heisinga. Nay. Nay. Hunt. Nay. Hunt. Nay. Nay. Isa. Nay. Nay. Ivy. Yes. Yay. Jackson of Illinois. Yay. Jackson of North Carolina. Yay. Jackson of Texas. Nay. Jackson Lee. Yay. Jacobs. Yay. James. Nay. Jayapal. Yay. Jeffries. Yay. Johnson of Georgia. Yay. Johnson of Louisiana. Nay. Johnson of Ohio. No. Nay. Johnson of South Dakota. Nay. Jordan. No. Nay. Joyce of Ohio. No. Nay. Joyce of Pennsylvania. No. Nay. Camlogger Dove. Yes. Yay. Captor. Yay. Kane of New Jersey. Nay. Keating. Yay. Yay. Kelly of Illinois. Yay. Yay. Kelly of Mississippi. No. Nay. Kelly of Pennsylvania. Absolutely not. Nay. Kana. Yes. Yay. Kiggins of Virginia. Nay. Kildee. Yeah. Yay. Kylie. Yeah. Nay. Kilmer. Yeah. Yay. Kim of California. Yeah. Nay. Kim of New Jersey. Yeah. Yay. Krishnamurthy. Yay. Custer. Yay. Custoff. Nay. La Hood. Nay. La Loda. Nay. La Malfa. Nay. Lamborn. Lamborn, nay. Landsman. Yay. Langworthy. Nay. Larson of Washington. Yay. Larson of Connecticut. Yay. Latta. Nay. Laturner. No. Nay. Lawler. No. Nay. Lee of California. 
Yay. Lee of Florida. No. Nay. Lee of Nevada. Yes. Yay. Lee of Pennsylvania. Yes. Yay. Ledger Fernandez. Yes. Yay. Lesko. No. Nay. Letlow. No. Nay. Levin. Yay. Yay. Lou. Yes. Yay. Lofgren. Yay. Loudermilk. No. Nay. Lucas. No. Nay. Luke Kemeyer. No. Nay. Luna. Luna. Latrell. Nay. Lynch. Yes. Yay. Mace. Yay. Magaziner. Yay. Maliotakis. Nay. Man. Nay. Manning. Yay. Massey. Nay. Mast. Nay. Matsui. Yay. Macbeth. Yay. McCall. No. Nay. McLean. Nay. McClellan. Yay. McClintock. Nay. McCollum. Yay. McCormick. Nay. McGarvey. Yay. McGovern. Yay. McHenry. No. Nay. Meeks. Aye. Yay. Menendez. Yes. Yay. Ming. Yes. Yay. Muser. No. Nay. Enfume. Aye. Yay. Miller of Illinois. Nay. Miller of Ohio. No. Nay. Miller of West Virginia. Nay. Nay. Miller Meeks. No. Nay. Mills. Mills. Molinaro. No. Nay. No. Molinar. No. Nay. Mooney. Yeah. Nay. More of Alabama. Nay. More of Utah. No. Nay. More of Wisconsin. Aye. Yay. Moran. No. Nay. Morelli. Aye. Yay. Moskowitz. Yes. Yay. Moulton. Yay. Yay. Mervan. Aye. Yay. Mullen. Yes. Yay. 
Murphy. Nay. Nadler. Aye. Yay. Napolitano. Yay. Neil. Yay. Nagoose. Yay. Nels. Nay. Newhouse. Nay. Nickel. Yay. Norcross. Yes. Yay. Norman. Nay. None of Iowa. No. Nay. Obernolte. No. Nay. Ocasio Cortez. Aye. Yay. Ogles. Nay. Omar. Yes. Yay. Owens. Nay. Pallone. Yes. Yay. Palmer. Nay. Panetta. Yay. Yay. Pasquale. Yes. Yay. Payne. Yes. Yay. Pelosi. Pelosi. Peltola. Peltola. Pence. No. Nay. Perez. Yes. Yay. Perry. Nay. Peters. Yay. Pedersen. Yay. Pfluger. Nay. Phillips. Yay. Pingreen. Yay. Pocan. Yay. Porter. Yay. Posey. Nay. Presley. Yay. Quigley. Yay. Ramirez. Yay. Raskin. Yay. Reschenthaler. Nay. Rogers of Washington. Nay. Rogers of Alabama. Nay. Rogers of Kentucky. Nay. Rose. Nay. Rosendale. Yay. Ross. Yay. Rouser. Nay. Roy. Nay. Ruiz. Yay. Rupersberger. Yay. Rutherford. No. Nay. Ryan. Yes. Yay. Salazar. No. Nay. Salinas. Yes. Yay. Sanchez. Aye. Yay. Santos. Nay. Sarbanes. Yay. Scalise. 
Nay. Scanlon. Yay. Sukowski. Yay. Schiff. Yay. Snyder. Yay. Skolton. Yay. Schreier. Yay. Swikert. Nay. Austin Scott. Nay. David Scott. Yay. Scott of Virginia. Yay. Self. Nay. Sessions. Nay. Sewell. Yay. Sherman. Yay. Cheryl. Yay. Simpson. Nay. Slotkin. Yay. Smith of Missouri. Nay. Smith of Nebraska. Nay. Smith of New Jersey. Nay. Smith of Washington. Yay. Smucker. Nay. Sorensen. Yay. Soto. Yay. Spamberger. Yay. Sparts. Nay. Stansberry. Yay. Stanton. Yay. Stauber. Nay. Steele. No. Stefanik. Nay. Style. Nay. Stuby. Nay. Stevens. Yay. Strickland. Yay. Strong. Nay. Swalwell. Yay. Sykes. Sykes, Takano, yay, Tenney, nay, Tanadar, yay, Thompson of California, yay, Thompson of Mississippi, yay. Thompson of Pennsylvania. No. Nay. Tiffany. No. Nay. Timmons. No. Nay. Titus. No. Yay. Tlaib. Yes. Yay. Takuda. No. Yes. Yay. Tonko. Yay. Torres of California. Yay. Torres of New York. Yay. Trahan. Yay. Trone. Yay. Turner. Nay. Underwood. Yes. Yay. Valadeo. No. Nay. 
Van Drew. Nobody pull a fire alarm. No. No. Van Dyne. Nay. Van Orden. No. Nay. Vargas. Aye. Yay. Vasquez. Yes. Yay. VC. Yes. Yay. Velasquez. Yes. yes. Wagner. Nay. Nay. Wahlberg. Nay. Nay. Waltz. No. Nay. Wasserman Schultz. Yay. Waters. Yes. Yay. Watson Coleman. Yes. Yay. Weber of Texas. No, ma'am. Nay. Webster of Florida. Nay. Nay. Winstrup. No. Nay. Westerman. Nay. Nay. Wexton. Yay. Wild. Yes. Yay. Williams of Georgia. Yes. Yay. Williams of New York. No. Nay. Williams of Texas. No. Nay. Wilson of Florida. Yay. Yay. Wilson of South Carolina. No. Nay. Whitman. No. Nay. Womack. No. Nay. Yakum. No. Nay. Zinke. No. Nay. Nay. McCarthy. Nay. House will be in order. The clerk will now call the names of members that have not already been recorded alphabetically. Banks. No. Nay. Bush. Bush. Kamek. Nay. Okay, I've got Carter of Texas next. Carter of Texas. Carter of Texas. Tony Gonzalez. No. Nay. Gooden of Texas. Gooden of Texas.
Luna. Luna. Mills. Nay. Pelosi. Pelosi. Peltola. Peltola. Sykes. Sykes. Are there other members are there other members in this body who have not been recorded or who wish to change their vote? You got the tally? On this vote, the yeas are 216, the nays are 210. The resolution is adopted. Without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid on the table. The Office of Speaker of the House of the United States House of Representatives is hereby declared vacant. This is an NBC News special report. Here's Lester Holt. Good afternoon, everyone. We're coming on the air with breaking news and a major shift in power on Capitol Hill. The House just voted to remove Speaker Kevin McCarthy from his post in a high stakes vote just now on the House floor. It comes after McCarthy, the top Republican, cut a deal with Democrats to avert a government shutdown over the weekend that angered some in his own party whose demands were dropped in the negotiations. It happened because one of those Republicans, Florida Congressman Matt Gates, introduced the resolution to remove McCarthy just last night. And it's the first time this process has ever successfully removed a House Speaker in American history. Let's go right now to senior Capitol Hill correspondent Garrett Haig. Garrett, what happens now? 
Lester, a speakership that began in historic fashion less than a year ago now ends in historic fashion with Kevin McCarthy, the first speaker to ever be removed from that position by a vote on the floor. What we'll see in the immediate term is the naming of a speaker pro tem, a temporary speaker, a caretaker speaker who will lead the House through the next election to replace Kevin McCarthy and select someone else to be second in line for the presidency. This could be a contentious process as well. The speaker lost eight Republicans. Republican votes, along with every Democrat voting to vacate the chair. Who could succeed him in this climate right now? Very much uh, an open question. The House will be largely paralyzed until that question can be answered, Lester. Is there a timeline for them to get this done? Lesser, we are in uncharted territory. It's cliche to say, but we have never been in this position before in the United States Congress. The House will move quickly. This Speaker Pro Tem idea is actually a new post 9-11 change to ensure continuity of government. So we are, we are very much in uncharted territory, but it is every indication that the House, Republicans still control it, who want to move quickly to name someone as their leader so they can continue the business of governing. Remember, they only have some 40 odd days to fund the government on on a longer term basis after that deal from over the weekend. All right, Garrett, we'll let you continue to work the story. Let me turn to our Meet the Press moderator, Kristen Welker. Uh, Garrett put it pretty well, uh, uncharted territory right now. So what does this mean going forward in terms of the mechanism of government? And that other question, who would want this job now? Well, that is the big question, and you saw Representative Patrick McHenry, who was standing there. He's a real ally of Speaker McCarthy. He's one of the names that has been floated about. But I think big picture, Lester, it really highlights the deep divisions within the Republican Party right now. The fact that this is happening after that showdown over trying to keep the government open. And the question becomes, what does happen next? Look, I've been talking to Republicans who are expressing frustration about what they're seeing on Capitol Hill. The fact that this is going on against the backdrop of 2024. They say, look, to the point that Garrett was just making, they only have a matter of days to try to get another deal to keep the government open. Moderate Republicans want to see deep spending cuts. They say all of this that's occurring right now on Capitol Hill is taking attention away from the critical work that needs to be done in that regard. Think about our polling, Lester, if you want to pull back the curtain just a little bit more. It shows Republicans getting high marks on things like the economy. And I think the question, the concern within the Republican Party is, will this type of activity on Capitol Hill, what GOP candidate Mike Pence has described as chaos, by the way, today, will that take away from those high marks that they are getting? And from the perspective of the voters, they are looking at a series of somewhat chaotic events. The standoff over the debt ceiling, the near government shutdown, the GOP frontrunner who's facing four indictments. So the big question, and could this mar them heading into 2024? All right, Lester. Kristen, thank you. For more, let's bring in our senior Washington correspondent, Hallie Jackson. Hallie, I'm interested in hearing your thoughts about the way forward and what this symbolizes for future speakers. Well, uh, right now, let's do short term, long term, Lester, because right now the word that comes to mind is essentially paralysis, because that is what is happening in the House of Representatives until this gets sorted out. Uh, Garrett sort of made a joke and I smiled a bit. Uncharted territory. Get ready to hear those two words a heck of a lot over the course of the next several days, weeks, who knows how long, because that is where we are. We don't know if now former Speaker Kevin McCarthy is going to try to run for the speakership again. We know it took him 15 votes to get it the first time. Might he try to throw his hat in the ring? Will there be other names, as you've heard described, who come forward on this part? And keep in mind the sheer drama politically of what we just saw, Lester, inside the Beltway, like we just don't see, right? It says something about our institutions. It says something about what the new normal is right now on Capitol Hill in Congress. There was an opportunity there. Um, there was a chance that Democrats could have maybe bailed out Kevin McCarthy even, and they made the decision, that party did, that they were going to let Kevin McCarthy sleep in the bed that he made. And why do I say that? Because the deal that got Kevin McCarthy the speakership in the first place was this, that it only would take one vote to bring up this motion, very procedural thing to potentially kick him out of office from the very beginning almost a year ago now not even a year ago the question had really not been if somebody would try to use that motion to kick him out it was a function of when well we now know the when piece of it after this deal to avoid a, a shutdown essentially was struck over the weekend um, it, it could have been any 
number of things. And I would say that's also just the tip of the iceberg for some of these ultra conservative uh, Republicans who have long on, not so wanted to see McCarthy in the speakership. So that's the short term thing as we're looking at these extraordinary images, the speaker pro tem of the House of Representatives running things recess now as Republicans are scrambling to figure out a way forward. And keep in mind those speeches that we saw, Lester, right? The it was Republican versus Republican. This was not something that involved sort of both sides in the aisle, as we often talk about and often hear about here in Washington. This this is, I think, the Republican ideological fight, the, the battle royale that is unfolding in that party writ large in, in several ways here. Longer term wise, listen, I think we've got to look at the way that American people view the institution here. Um, there is a process, and you've, you've heard a lot about from McCarthy allies about this process essentially being undermined, and you heard anger fiery anger from some of McCarthy's allies on the floor that, you know, th this is political gamesmanship. The, the question that perhaps those like Congressman Gates are doing this to raise money, to raise their profiles, if you will. So all of it, let me go back to sort of where we started here. Uncharted territory, Lester, no kidding. That's where we are and that's where we're going to be for a bit. Yeah, we're seeing the pictures of the major players. Matt Gates, who was the one that pulled the political trigger on this. He was talking to reporters on, on Capitol Hill. We'll hear more from him, I suspect. Let me bring in... Well, uh, you know, the stages actually, of grief, I think, are uh, in progress right let's now. Let's listen to a little of this. Colleagues, I think there was a stage of denial, and I've certainly experienced a good amount of their anger, and now we appear to be headed toward bargaining. I think the world of Steve Scalise, I think he'd make a phenomenal speaker. Have, have any, has anyone spoken to you? We've got less than 45. I'm afraid of $33 trillion in debt crushing the working people in my district. I'm afraid of the dollar losing its status as the global reserve currency. If they want to expel me, let me know when they have the Has vote. Has anyone talked about that with you? Five days left before we sorry, go got less than 45 days left. All right, we're listening to uh, Matt Gates again. He pulled the political trigger, started the mechanism that led to today's ouster of the uh, now outgoing. We've heard you say you're a fighter so many Republican times. Leader. You said you would win. Fight continues. He's going to walk past cameras waiting to see if Kevin McCarthy was going to make any comments as he leaves the uh, the chamber. Uh, Matt Gates continue to talk. Let me bring in Chief White House Correspondent Peter Alexander. Peter, what's the view from the White House on all this? Uh, the West Wing, uh, no indication whether or not President Biden is watching the events as they've been taking place uh, on Capitol Hill, but I can tell you that I saw some of his senior aides glued to their televisions watching what's going on right here. The White House is really casting this as a split-screen moment, effectively saying that while President Biden is focused on delivering for the American people, the extreme, in their words, House Republicans uh, are effectively in disarray right now. The president today announcing what is a historic moment in its own right, that for the first time in its 60-year history, Medicare would be negotiating with 10 drug manufacturers to try to bring down prices for things like Eliquis and all sorts of different uh, prescription drugs that many Americans are familiar with right now, while the Republicans are fighting among themselves. I'm struck as we watch what's taking place on the Hill, Lester, by a big headline, only a matter of maybe a decade ago. They celebrated, Republicans did, the new generation of conservative leaders, the young guns as they were described, Paul Ryan, Eric Cantor, and Kevin McCarthy. Paul Ryan, no longer in Congress. Eric Cantor, booted as well. Kevin McCarthy, now a historic figure, becoming the first House Speaker to lose his position by a vote of this kind. So just another example of how, at least in the eyes of the White House, and frankly, um, for anybody watching right now, the real challenges continue to exist for this Republican Party that has been feuding among itself, and obviously among itself, and obviously Donald Trump's role in all of this. Donald Trump, who you'll remember only a matter of a couple of weeks ago, was saying that House Republicans should shut down the government if they couldn't get the deal that they wanted. Well, the shutdown was averted. Kevin McCarthy made sure that didn't happen, but ultimately it cost him his job, Lester. All right, Peter Alexander at the White House, thank you. Let me go back to our senior Capitol Hill correspondent, Garrett Hay. Garrett, it's not lost on anyone that Democrats were in a position to save uh, McCarthy's job, and they made the collective decision not to. What, what, what's the, the blowback, potential blowback, the effect on, on Democrats? 
Well, Lester, we'll see where this lands when a new speaker is ultimately chosen, but Democrats felt like they owed Kevin McCarthy nothing, and frankly, he made no effort to even approach them in any serious manner to save his speakership. In fact, in this caucus meeting Democrats held this morning, where they discussed and debated how they would respond to this motion, the Democratic leaders played a video of McCarthy on the Sunday shows this weekend attacking Democrats and suggesting it was Democrats who drove the country to the edge of a government shut down this week, knowing full well that he would need those Democratic votes if he wanted to remain in power. For, for some Democratic lawmakers, that was a last straw. They never trusted Kevin McCarthy, not based on any of his recent behavior, his, his uh, role in the negotiating of the debt ceiling deal, for example, that he immediately backed away from. But even going back farther than that, his actions after January 6th, where he condemned Donald Trump on the floor, then traveled to Mar-a-Lago to court his support, where he undercut a bipartisan commission to investigate the 6th that he himself had asked to be created. Democrats felt like this was not a choice between the lesser of two evils. This was someone who was basically in league with the same forces who had now turned against him. And so there wasn't really much of a choice or, or a decision to be made here. McCarthy and the speakership was Republicans' problem, and Democrats would vote as a block to basically say, we don't want this guy. Solve your own problem, Republicans. That's the choice they've made, and we'll see how that plays out in the longer term when a new speaker is chosen, Lester. Yeah, was it ever clear the number and what kind of deals that were made for him to get the job in the first place? This has always been a question, Lester, and perhaps we'll get a better answer now that he is no longer the speaker. Uh, the conservative faction of House Republicans said there a variety of deals were made, including placing some of their members on the Rules Committee, which controls what bills come to the floor, that spending bills, for example, like the ones we've been debating over the last couple months, would be brought up on an individual basis rather than in a big group all before Christmas, as is often the case. But there were also conservative members who said there were other deals that were made, side deals on various policy positions or guaranteeing ver votes on various issues. McCarthy never formally confirmed any of that publicly. No paper was ever produced to confirm those deals. But it, it, it's that lack of trust that I think contributed to the position McCarthy's in now. I think about someone like Nancy Mace, who is a member who has been at times allied with McCarthy, but who's repeatedly said how frustrated she was that she couldn't count on him to keep his word to her. She was a surprise yes vote to replace McCarthy. McCarthy today. And, and uh, I assume there's great pressure, obviously, to get things worked out and back on track as quickly as they possibly can. Yeah, and I think that's one of the great ironies of all this, Lester, is whoever the new speaker is, and whether they're chosen today or a week from now or three weeks from now, will have to deal with all the same problems this speaker did. I just interviewed one of the uh, House Republicans who voted against McCarthy who was explaining to me his frustration with the mounting debt in this country and the spending bills being as large as they are. And I asked him, probably not, but we have to try. So we could very much find ourselves in a similar position with a new speaker in the not-too-distant future, Lester. Garrett Hake, thanks very much. That concludes our special report. Much more ahead on our streaming network, NBC News Now. And I'll see you tonight with more on NBC Nightly News. For now, I'm Lester Holt in New York. Good day. and we're picking it up right there here in Washington with that thing that we have never seen before in American history. A sitting speaker yanked from his position by members of his own party. This stunning rebellion led by Florida Congressman Matt Gates and a number of other House Republicans. You've seen the congressman, the one who started this whole charge, speaking live on the steps of the Capitol. We're going to show you that in just a second here. He and others, as you see, see Kevin McCarthy walking out of the chamber immediately after that vote. Those ultra conservatives in his party furious that McCarthy did a deal to keep the government from shutting down over the weekend. Although for them, that is just the tip of the iceberg. And Democrats, they refuse to bail out McCarthy. All of them voting yes here with their message to him. Basically, you've made your bed, now lie in it. So McCarthy now has the dubious distinction of being the first speaker ever ousted by his colleagues with this motion. So what is next? That's what everybody wants to know. Temporary speaker is stepping into place here. Uh, speaker pro tem, that is his title, Patrick McHenry. He was on this secret list that Kevin McCarthy handed over way back when he got their speakership. Kind of a in case of emergency type of thing. Well, 
That is what is happening here in the eyes of McCarthy. After that, members are going to have to vote on a new Speaker of the House. We don't know if McCarthy's going to end up throwing his hat in the ring again. That seems potentially likely, although we really can't say for sure. Remember, last time it took 15 votes over the course of several days to get McCarthy the speakership he has wanted for years. So why does this matter? Why should you care if you live outside the Beltway, let's say? Well, Total paralysis in the House for what could be another long political battle royale for the speakership. What about money to help Ukraine? That's going to be held up, potentially. This is an issue President Biden has framed as life or death. And then keeping the government open, that deadline after some temporary can kicking is just 43 days away. There are real world implications to what you have just watched unfold on the House floor, something that nobody in modern history has ever seen. NBC's Sahil Kapoor is there. We've got former Republican Carlos, uh, Congressman rather, Carlos Cabello joining us here. Washington Post national political reporter Eugene Scott and former housing secretary under former President Obama and a former presidential candidate, Julian Castro, who is joining us as well. Sahil, let me start with you. We've seen some movement in the hallway. Kevin McCarthy walked by, didn't look like he took questions. This split screen as Congressman Matt Gates is out on the steps of the Capitol explaining his rationale for ousting the now former speaker. Where does this go next? What's the biggest thread that you're trying to pull on? We just witnessed history, Hallie. Kevin McCarthy is now the former Speaker of the House, becomes the first man to hold that job, man or woman to hold that job, who has been removed by a vote of the House in the middle of the session. What happens next is far from clear. This throws the House into bedlam. The chamber cannot function without an elected Speaker, and it's far from clear who that's going to be. Patrick McHenry, the Republican congressman who's popular with many of his colleagues, uh, has been chosen to be the Speaker pro tem. He's going to hold that job until a successor is appointed. There is no clear successor in waiting at this time. There's been no effort by McCarthy's allies, by his leadership team to find a successor. They say they have been fully behind him. There has been no attempt by Matt Gates, the ultra-conservative congressman who led this successful effort to oust McCarthy to find a replacement. Gates believes that is not his job. He's only gone so far as saying it won't be him, which is obvious to anyone who has covered this place. Uh, this is an unprecedented moment of chaos for the House of Representatives. And many of the Republicans that I've been speaking to uh, throughout the day, throughout these last several days, say it is only going to make their jobs harder. It is only going to make these conservative policies that they've been fighting for less achievable. And we heard this on the floor as well. Many of them uh, warning uh, the, you know, the Matt Gateses of, of the House Republican Conference that if they were to succeed, it would make the chamber more liberal. It would end up empowering Democrats. It's not clear that's going to happen either, Hallie. It's, excuse me, it's an, simply an unprecedented situation. We have nothing to fall back on in terms of figuring out what, uh, what happens next. Uh, we will, we'll, we'll wait and see, but the next step is going to be someone's going to have to throw their hat in the ring. There's going to be another speaker's battle. It could be Kevin McCarthy. Some people want him to simply run again and do more ballots, but is he going to want to do that again? Is he going to have the support? I mean, we don't know, right? Question mark is the headline of the moment here. I want to get to Garrett Hake, our Capitol Hill correspondent, who was valiantly attempting to get an answer from Speaker McCarthy, or I should say former Speaker McCarthy, as he was walking out of the chamber. You know, on the other side of the, of the Capitol there, Garrett, you have uh, Senator Shelley Moore Capito saying America, the American people are looking at this going, are you guys nuts? Um, there is a bigger issue here at hand in the Republican Party beyond simply the machinations of where does this actually go and how do they get to govern it? Yeah, Hallie, I think that's right. I mean, look, I think 90 percent of the Republican Party, certainly in Congress, but perhaps writ large across the country, thinks what they just saw is ridiculous, that Kevin McCarthy had been acting in reasonably good faith as a conservative speaker to try to advance their agenda. He had united the various factions of the Republican Party, and although his minority was, or his majority was not as big as he wanted, and frankly, that probably contributed to his downfall here at the end, he did bring the party back to power in the House with it, by dint of his own fundraising and campaigning and candidate recruitment and the thanks he got for that is to be one of the shortest tenured speakers in American history and the hmm. first ever to be removed. And so this is, I think, one of the questions for these Republican rebels. And in fact, I just asked one of them this the other day or a few minutes ago. These days are all running together. <laughs> How do you convince the country that you can govern if this is what you're doing? And, and his response to me was, we have to actually do the things that we ran on. We have to align basically our promises with our, our actions in Congress and I think the challenge for those members and the reality the Republican Party is going to have to face at some point, maybe today, maybe in the future, is you cannot promise 
to massively cut federal spending, for example, with two thirds of the government controlled by Democrats. It's just not the way our system works. Uh, mm. And unless and until this small faction within the Republican Party learns that message, uh, they're going to bang their heads against the wall repeatedly and publicly on mm. national television in just even selecting their leaders, much less in trying to govern. Uh, Garrett Hake, we're so glad to have you here. I know you got to run and do some work for the zillion other jobs that you have. Thank you, friend. We'll come back to you when we can. Yeah. Uh, let's get to Congressman Burchett, who I believe is at the microphone. Let's listen. And um, and I was on maybe CNN or something last night, and I said that you know I was praying about it. I had two. I went down two paths on this thing. You know, I said I said that that I was um, uh, that uh, I was afraid I'd lose a friend. And Kevin McCarthy, which I'm sure I have, and I said, and and then I, and I had to that or my conscience, and I was praying about the right answer. And I said that last night, and then, you know, the first thing, pretty much, and I was going to listen to him. I honestly was going to listen. I'm not lying to y'all. I didn't. I could have. I could have changed it. It's Washington. Everybody changes their mind up here every day, and then, but that kind of sealed it with me. That just said to me that shows, you know, where his heart's at, and it's and and to me that that. Um, showed his character. Can you explain? Who would you like you know, to see think... as, as taking over as speaker? I don't know. You don't know yet? If you give me your name, I could put it in. Eric Rizzolis. <laughs> All right, Eric. Good deal. Can I fly in the plane Harris with you? Yes, sir. Yeah, Congressman, Congressman, yes, ma'am. This is like the classic PBS question. Sure. I think a lot of Americans are looking at this, and they just don't understand why it was worth this. The House is in limbo right now. No, nothing can Well, here's, a, here's why it's worth it to me, is because we had seven weeks where we were basically off and let's be honest what were they doing they were on any fact-finding missions folks they were on trips all over the globe at your expense and that usually it's four weeks this time it was six weeks we knew the budget was coming up that we could have collapsed the whole thing yet we went on and went on and played sorry about that we went on and played for six weeks and then then they come at me and say, well, you're going to cause the government to shut down. All these people are going to hurt. Well, I'll tell you what, when I think about that, that you know, those single moms in my district that, that bust their ass every day and hit two, have to hit two jobs because we're crashing this economy, because we, can, we don't have the guts to make tough decisions. I think about them when this economy collapses. And I can guarantee you three days of shutdown would look like a summer vacation for them compared to what this thing could happen because they are working too dadgum hard. I mean, look at it right now. You go look at a $100,000 pickup truck right now, I wouldn't step out of the electric chair to ride in one of those dadgum things. Congressman, I saw you sitting next to Matt Gates as this was unfolding. Right, let me correct you. Matt Gates was sitting next to me. Correct. There was uh, an open seat because somebody got my usual seat on the side. They said everybody was sitting over there and all I was sitting over there and I was like, hey, somebody's Andy Ogles was in my seat. I saw you two leaned over and whispered to each other when the result was known. What did he say to you? I don't recall. I don't recall. Yeah. And, and what happens next? Where do we go from here? Uh, well, we go into conference meetings in our respective... You have been listening to one of the Republican members of Congress who voted against the speakership of Kevin McCarthy. Uh, John Allen is with us here from NBC News, one of our political analysts. And John, you heard him talking about the rationale there. You heard that question, this idea, you know, who's going to be speaker now? Let me throw my name into the mix. You know, it's John Allen, Hallie Jackson, Eugene Scott, take your pick. It could be anybody. And that's the point here. Uh, what you've got is a very small number of members of the House that basically ran the House today. And they decided they were going to burn it down or at least burn down uh, the Republican majority. Obviously, the vast number of majority of Republicans wanted Kevin McCarthy to re remain as speaker. These guys burned down the House, and they don't know who they want uh, to rebuild it. They don't know who they want as fire chief. And I think that was helpful to them that they weren't able, that they weren't identifying somebody as the uh, person against McCarthy, right? To be able to say, hey, look, let's just have nothing and see what happens. I think we're going to see a lot of chaos ensuing now. There are no rules for this. This is being written as we speak by parliamentarians, by uh, House leaders, by people inside and outside Congress as to what happens next. But the truth is, we just don't know Who's going to be running the Republican conference? We don't know who's going to be running the House of Representatives. And there's nobody for Joe Biden or Democrats in the Senate to negotiate with until they figure that out. Congressman Curbelo, let me go to you because you've sat on that House floor. You've taken votes on that House floor. You've taken some unusual votes on that floor, but nothing ever like this. That's right, Hallie. And look, some people are surprised, but in reality, this has been years in the making. I remind people that in 2015, John Boehner only got enough votes to become speaker because a lot of Democrats were at a funeral. They were not in the chamber that day, lowering the vote threshold for John Boehner. So this group has been at it for a long time, Hallie. And today was unavoidable because 
the, this small minority within the House Republican conference, we're not talking about a congressional minority, we're talking about a small minority within one party believes that they can impose their will on the entire country despite lacking the votes to do so, even within their own party. These are the expectations that they've had of their leaders for years, at least since 2011, when Republicans came back into the majority with John Boehner. They've had unreasonable expectations. They've been unrealistic about what can be achieved, especially in divided government. And they worked to make this day happen. And now the institution is rudderless. No one knows where they're going. I guess there's a choice to make now, and all 435 members have to make this. Do they try to do the same thing again and leave the institution hostage? to this small group, or do they try to forge a new way forward that's more inclusive of a broader majority and that can include members of both parties? Congressman, thank you. Stand by for a second here because I want to get to Eugene Scott Axios, by the way. <laughs> Forgive me for earlier. Um, who's going to lead the House, right? I mean, that's the one of the many questions that people have and perhaps the most important one here. We heard the reporting that perhaps Speaker McCarthy force of habit. Former Speaker McCarthy may try to throw his hat in the ring again. Uh, we don't know if that's going to be the case. He did not answer that question in the last 35 seconds since we've been watching all of this unfold live. What's your sense? Well, we obviously need to pay attention to these hard right Republicans who've made it very clear that they have this agenda and vision for America that they don't feel like Kevin McCarthy was moving forward with uh, making into legislation, turning into legislation. But someone else we have to pay attention to is Nancy Mace from South Carolina, mm -hmm. who also voted. And she voted in the way she did because she said Kevin McCarthy had not kept his promises to her. Kevin McCarthy made quite a few promises when he was trying to become speaker in January. And it was impossible to fulfill all of those promises to everyone because the GOP actually is more ideologically diverse than I think a lot of people realize. Different people have made different promises to their constituents. Who can they find that all, enough of them can agree on uh, to put yeah. in leadership? It's not yet clear yet. Let me play a little bit of what we heard from Congressman Gates because he said some interesting things just going through some of this here, including that it turns out getting 200 Republicans to trust you isn't enough to actually keep the speakership. Again, this is a Republican member of Congress, one of the more ultra conservative members of Congress up against uh, Speaker, former Speaker McCarthy. Listen. When I talked with you yesterday before you introduced the motion. You didn't sound confident that you would have the votes. Now you do. What does that tell you about where your confidence is at? What it tells me is that you're very poor at reading confidence. Congressman Corbello, when you hear that from uh, one of your former colleagues, what goes through your mind as somebody who you know knows this party, has served this party, and is still involved with the party? Well, look, it, it's just further evidence that the whole party's in disarray. And again, this started, Hallie, back in 2011, 2012, but Donald Trump and the culture that he's instilled in the Republican Party has accelerated all of this, has put it on steroids. And that's what pushed the party to the point where it's at today, where a small faction, a small faction of members decided to embarrass their leadership, uh, to diminish their party uh, before the country, to send the message that this party cannot govern because it cannot even elect or keep a leader in one of the chambers of the U.S. Congress. And uh, Matt Gates, someone who I know, someone who I served with, uh, someone who I thought could actually um, uh, make some contributions and he was first elected, uh, has really put himself before the institution and has created a level of chaos in Congress that we haven't seen, at least not for a very long time. Congressman, thanks. Let me go back to Sahil Kapoor, who I believe is still with us there from Capitol Hill. Sahil? Um, it's my understanding now, based on our team's reporting, that we know when the Republicans will get together to figure out next steps. It's going to be in about an hour and change from now, 6.30 Eastern time, according to multiple sources talking with our team. Uh, what's that going to look like? They have got a lot of work to do, Hallie. I don't even know where they would begin here. They had not been, they had not prepared for this eventuality as likely as it looked over the last few days. They simply, uh, the vast majority of them, more than 90% of Republicans have been unified behind Kevin McCarthy. They don't, they need way more than 90%. So they've got to go all the way back to the drawing board. It is January 2023 all over again. They have a narrow majority. They have a band of far-right agitators who want a speaker to deliver something 
something that the vast majority of the Republican conference believes is not possible when you have a Democrat, uh, a Democratic-led Senate, you have a, a Democratic president in Joe Biden controlling the White House who has to sign bills. And that's a large part what this came down to. You heard Gates on the floor talk about that debt limit deal that McCarthy struck with President Biden several months ago as the original sin. That was a must-pass piece of legislation that McCarthy decided was necessary to prevent an economic calamity. His only path was to work with Democrats. His agitators are not accepting that. One other thing that, that struck me, Hallie, watching that brief uh, one-hour debate ahead of this is that some of the uh, Republicans who stood up and spoke on behalf of Kevin McCarthy mm -hmm. have been the right-wing agitators of the past. Jim Jordan, Tom Massey, these were tormentors of the last several speakers, including John Boehner and, and uh, to uh, some extent Paul Ryan as well. Now they are those once upon a time far right Republicans have moved into the mainstream of the party and there's a new generation of agitators uh, that wants to achieve things that, you know, members like Carlos Corbello when he was in the House know is not possible. Where this goes from here is unclear, but Republicans have a, a mountain to climb. Sahil, thanks. Uh, I am struck by the fact of the matter that this is, uh, and, and uh, Congressman Castro, Secretary Castro, I'll bring you in here, this is a Republican on Republican issue. The debate made that crystal clear. This is a matter for the Republican Party. But there was a moment about looking at the clock seven hours ago where there was a question of whether Democrats might actually bail out Kevin McCarthy, perhaps uh, conversations that were allegedly being had based on our team's reporting, some members getting calls, for example. And I'm curious as to your perspective on this, because we heard from the Democratic leader in the House of Representatives, Hakeem Jeffries, laying out the very specific reasons why Democrats would not, in fact, make this move to save Kevin McCarthy's speakership. First reason, they didn't like how he tweaked what they describe as crucial House rules, giving away prime committee slots, they say to members on the far right. Second, the whole motion to vacate in the first place, this procedural piece uh, that essentially changed the rules to allow one single member to bring up this whole issue in the first place. Third, frustration over policies that Democrats say are motivated by the MAGA arm of the Republican Party. Fourth, they had some issues with the way that the defense authorization bill was run. And fifth, the impeachment inquiry that has begun against President Biden here. How do you see this, um, Secretary Castro? What would you have done in this situation? And where do Democrats go from here? Is this a function of just sitting back and letting Republicans figure it out? Yeah, you know, I think it's like uh, Representative Jayapal put it, that this was a mess that Republicans created. It's a mess that they're going to have to solve. Uh, and Minority Leader Jeffries laid out the case. There was a question mark, but I think that the Democrats answered that uh, for good reason. Look, this was a speaker in Kevin McCarthy who routinely would blame Democrats, even going on the Sunday shows this past Sunday, to blame them for the chaos, who started an impeachment inquiry against President Biden on no real evidence. And also, and this is important still, even in this day and age, didn't make any kind of real personal effort. The, the basic politics that it takes to try and smooth over any disagreements and get support from the other side. He didn't really do that. That's what I've heard and others have heard all day from Democrats. Mm -hmm. And then, just mm -hmm. as importantly, there was a feeling in the Democratic caucus that, look, um, if you're going to make a deal, probably you have better leverage down the road and not at this point. Uh, I think it's a sense as well that if they were to have saved Speaker McCarthy, then all of these bad decisions that he keeps making, they would kind of own it. And Matt Gates alluded to that the other day. Basically, you know, if you want to keep him, keep him and he's yours. I don't think they want to own that because this is a speaker that has not made good, has not demonstrated good judgment, who seems to, who seemed only to be concerned about hanging on to power. You don't want to latch yourself onto that. You mentioned specifically something that Kevin McCarthy said just about 48 hours ago that seemed to really tick off a lot of Democrats in particular. This was cited specifically. I want to play that moment. It was from one of the Sunday shows over on CBS. Watch. The Democrats tried to do everything they can not to let it pass. Democrats stick together, government. but they did not want the bill. They did not. They, they were willing to let government shut down for our military not to be paid. If he hadn't said that, sir, do you believe the Democrats would have made a different decision or no? Well, I think there would have been a better chance and maybe he could have gotten a few Democrats who were willing to go in his direction. But look, 226 Democrats in the end voted uh, to pass that CR. It was because of Democrats, majority of the folks that supported it, that 
we still have a functioning government right now, that was a slap in the face. And it was just another example of really that he's not a good politician. Kevin McCarthy fundamentally was out of his league and demonstrated that at different points of his speakership. Eugene, a lot of uh, Kevin McCarthy's supporters, as we heard in this debate, talked about how this could have a negative trickle-down effect on the next set of congressional elections coming up in just about a year from now. How do you see it? Well, that's true. I mean, uh, tone has been set, and there's no reason to believe that these this group they seem obviously very adamant about the decision that they just made. They're not going to take another approach. I think one thing that's going to be really interesting in terms of how this has a trickle down effect is how many people who were aspiring for leadership before now still want to be in leadership, right? They know how hard it will be to please everyone, to get the support from across the aisle, and to keep people believing that you can do the job, even during rough moments when you have uh, a difficult time delivering on the promises that you told your voters you would deliver on. Hallie, to Eugene's point, just real quick. Please. I talked to Congressman Brendan Boyle earlier today, Democrat for Pennsylvania, and he said, uh, he said, if you hate someone, vote for him to be the Republican Speaker of the House. Because of how hard of a job it exactly. is. Exactly. Yeah. Who would want this gig? I mean, Kevin McCarthy, we know, he was super ambitious. He wanted the job for a long time. He was willing to endure all kinds of humiliation, including the humiliation he saw today. That is a rare quality in a mm -hmm. human being. Uh, and whoever were to replace McCarthy, if they're able to come up with somebody to, to replace McCarthy, is going to endure the same stuff. Today you saw that small group. Matt Gates ran the House of Representatives today, and anybody that comes into that job is going to have to deal with either Matt Gates or somebody like him doing the exact same thing to them. You talk about, oh, please. I was just going to say an example of that is when McCarthy was trying to become a speaker the first time or maybe the fifth time, uh, Byron Donalds from Florida was a name that was mentioned. Very recently someone asked if he would want to put his name up again. He was like, I'm not so sure, because he knows what comes with it in this moment that perhaps wasn't yeah. very clear eight, nine months ago. You and talk about who... No, I was going to say, let me just say this, because you talk about who could be speaker next. And I want to show people some of the options that, that we could see potentially. And we don't know, but these are just some of the names that would be, I think, based on sort of educated speculation, people who could be in the mix for it. If it wouldn't take you away from our viewers, Hallie, I would definitely not put you forward and say you should be the speaker of the house. Uh, but I think it would no, be thanks. a loss for our viewers. Right, exactly. No, thanks. I was just going to say that, like, you know, 10 years ago, uh, 12 years ago, you saw a whole bunch of the top leadership potential folks in the house leave. Mm. Adam Putnam went to go run uh, for agriculture secretary in Florida. Mike Pence left to go uh, run for governor of Indiana. And so you're going to see that group that I, uh, that we just put up there. You know, Tom Emmer from Minnesota, yeah. Steve Scalise from Louisiana, who's battling blood cancer, but has wanted to be, uh, you know, in that mix, at least Stefanik from New York. All of them have got to be watching this and, and thinking to themselves, God, I want that, that portrait someday in the speaker's lobby of the former speaker, but they don't want to have to go through what it will take to get that portrait. So then, Saho, let's talk about the guy who's actually in that position right now, albeit in a caretaker role temporarily. What does life look like at the moment for Speaker Pro Tem Patrick McHenry, McHenry who has been an incredibly loyal ally of, of Kevin McCarthy's to this point? just to keep the trains running as simply as humanly possible and not let them crash into a wall. I mean, he doesn't have authority to do much. You know, he doesn't have the vote, uh, the confidence of the House of Representatives if he were to make major decisions like what legislation to put on the floor or what direction to go in as a conference. The, the House of Representatives is leaderless right now. The Republican conference is leaderless right now. And you know, Hallie, there's been a lot of talk about narrow majorities, and it's very true that Kevin McCarthy has a very narrow majority which contributed to his loss. But it's worth noting that Nancy Pelosi had an identically small majority over the last two years, and none of this stuff happened. We never saw her, you know, cater to people who wanted to, to uh, prevent her from having that job, who wanted to remove her, uh, some of her enemies. She didn't make these rules concessions that would make her job more difficult. Um, she, you know, simply declined to play that game. And even though there was a lot of ideological variation, a lot of uh, disputes within her party, think Josh Gottheimer on one hand and Ilhan Omar on the other hand, they disagreed on mm. so many things. None of them ever came after her in this manner. So it's also a tale of, you know, the two parties being very different in this, that Republicans, their ideologues have more a higher tolerance threshold for chaos in moments like this. And that's a big part of what's leading to, to this moment. And lastly, Hallie, we've been reporting for a while now, for weeks now, that Kevin McCarthy could either keep the government open or keep his job. For a long time, it looked like he would prefer to keep his job. He decided to keep the government open, uh, decided to put that clean a continuing resolution on the floor, pass it with Democratic votes, and that turned out to be the last straw for Matt Gates. He's now former Speaker of the House as a result.
you know, we're, we're talking about what this looks like now for the next 24, 48 hours, if not beyond, on Capitol Hill. And you two have been so indulgent, the, the folks here on set with me, because I'm looking at my phone, I'm texting, just hearing from a member. Um, and and the, honestly, the answer is basically a, a shrug emoji here, that people just have no idea where this goes next. That is why what's going to happen in the course of the next maybe two hours is so significant, Sahil, um, as we await to see any Democrats who may come to the microphones to speak. And more importantly, as that Republican conference meeting gets set to begin, as you can see, a live look now uh, as that Republican conference meeting gets set to begin in just one hour from now on the other side of the aisle. Question is, who shows up for it? Right. Is that going to be a closed door meeting where you have Matt Gates and the others who just voted to oust Kevin McCarthy coming up to McCarthy and McHenry and the people who are uh, looking for the next steps forward in the conference? The potential for fireworks is huge, Sahil. It certainly is. We don't know who's going to emerge from that. It will be a very different set of people than we've ever seen at one of these House Republican leadership press conferences because their top leader, Kevin McCarthy, has since been ousted. Now, do they all come to the mics with McCarthy and say, he is still our leader, we're going to put him up for speaker again, we're going to do another 15 ballots or 20 ballots or 30 ballots or however long it takes? That could be a possibility. You know, there are some Republican lawmakers who have told us that it has to be Kevin McCarthy. There is simply nobody else who can get the vote you know, necessary to unify to unify the conference. So uh, the big question there for Republicans. Also, uh, an important question here for for Democrats, Hallie. It's very clear that Democrats had been entertaining in these last few days the possibility of a negotiation with Kevin McCarthy that would lead to them, you know, saving him, most likely by casting votes as present and lowering the threshold. They were never going to vote for him. But that, uh, you know, that hit a brick wall earlier this morning when McCarthy said on CNBC that my offer to you is nothing. He's not giving Democrats anything. He prefers it's a, it's kind of a choice. It's a choice ne necessitated, you know, by politics. But he has decided that his only path forward is to cater to the Republican hardliners, that he would rather deal with the Matt Gaetzes of the world than moderate Democrats. There isn't a realistic possibility of a coalition speaker at this moment. Let's see how Democrats mm -hmm. play it. They're certainly, it looks like they're going to continue to support Hakeem Jeffries. They're the minority leader for speaker. He's never going to get the votes uh, while Republicans have even a tiny majority. Um, that, you know, that, again, that leaves the House in the same place of chaos. Congressman Corbello, practically speaking, what does this mean for people who aren't serving as members of Congress or covering members of Congress, if you will? In other words, if this lasts, we know what the implications are if this were to last, let's say, 44 more days, right? That we'd be in a real hot mess right as we hit that next deadline for the government to shut down. But as far as the next couple of days, couple of weeks, what should people be expecting? Well, Hallie, number one, that this is going to dominate the news and that it's all going to be about chaos and dysfunction in Washington. This is going to further erode trust and confidence in our institutions. Uh, we get that question in every poll. Is the country on the right track or the wrong track? We're going to see that number continuing to grow because Americans are going to accurately perceive that their government isn't functional because literally it's not functioning. And by the way, of course, Congress does these big things like fund the government, but the House is constantly passing bills that are important for communities, for the operations of the country, for the operation of the U.S. Postal Service. Uh, all of that is, is going away. None of that is going to happen. Of course, the Senate's there, but they can't do anything on their own. So this is a real crisis. And of course, Hallie, this is also going to diminish our standing in the world. I mean, look, my family came to this country from Cuba because this was the beacon of democracy, right? The place where everything worked well, where people disagreed but shook hands and then figured it out. Well, well, that image is disappearing, and the United States is going to have less of a moral voice on the world stage as a result of this. So the consequences are real. I know it's easy to dismiss. This is just more D.C. chaos. This is annoying. Hmm. Who cares? They'll, they'll figure it out. No, no, this is a big deal. Congressman, thank you. In one hour from now, we will see the Republicans meet, according to sources talking with members of our team to figure out the next steps forward. Very quickly, final thoughts, lightning round, one sentence before we go from all of you. What are you going to be watching for? Sahal, I'll start with you. Whether they have a nominee for speaker, whether they say uh, Kevin McCarthy should be speaker, I think that's the big one. E either, they, either they continue to stand behind him or it's over for him. They're not going to be putting him up again. That's the big decision they have to make uh, before anything else. John Allen. The chaos is the point. Matt Gates and those with him love chaos. They want it to look like Washington can't function, so they win when it doesn't. Eugene. I'll be paying attention to who's president and who's absent. Secretary Castro. 
whether you're gonna have enough of those Republicans that are gonna be adults in the room now. They, they, they accomplished what they wanted to with Kevin McCarthy. Are they gonna be adults in the room now? Final word to you, Congressman. Watch the man in the chair right now, Patrick McHenry. Of all of those potential candidates that you put up, Hallie, he's the one that's most respected and trusted in the conference. If Kevin McCarthy doesn't want it, it's McHenry's next. Thank you all so much for being with us as we've continued our live rolling coverage right here on NBC News. Now, more to come over the course of the next 90 minutes or so. And of course, we will be all over every development live from Capitol Hill, including that meeting set to begin in now 59 minutes. We're going to sneak in a quick break and get to some other news on the way out, including the new essential gag order that a judge has just put on former President Trump.